Good afternoon, Council of Officers and Viewing Public. Welcome to this meeting of the Birmingham and Solihull Joint Health Scrutiny Committee. May I remind members that the meeting will be webcast for live or subsequent broadcast via the Council Meetings YouTube site, and that members of the press public may record and take photographs except where there are confidential or exempt items. Can I remind officers and guests in the room to please speak directly into the microphones to ensure that the live streaming is clearly audible. May I remind members of the public attending that this is a meeting in public, not a public meeting. No public questions have been submitted in advance of the meeting and no public questions will be asked during the meeting. Second item is apologies. Can I ask both members and scrutiny officers if there have been any apologies for the meeting? No apologies. Declaration of interest. Can I ask members if they have any declarations of interest to make? Mr. Mixon's still in writing, so just to say what about monitor directors is a councillor. Pardon? We submitted one to Gail in writing um, around declarations of interest. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Chair, it's just that a charity I'm a trustee of um, is commissioned as a partner with UHB, so I'll just declare that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Moore. Okay, minutes is the next item, so we need to confirm the minutes for the meeting held on the 13th of October 22. There's some, three items I need to update the committee on relating to the Birmingham and Solihull Integrated Care System Performance Finance and Recovery Plan. First of which is, it was requested that future reports include ambulance response times and time scales for hospital discharges. These have been included as part of the reporting of the BSOP ICS Republic recovery plan, which you will receive today. So the second point was queries were raised on the growing use of private health sector service private health sector services due to pressure on NHS services. Healthwatch produced a briefing note outlining the feedback they have received from residents, and this was shared with members last week. Can I confirm that members have actually received that? Okay, I assume that's correct then. The last of the three points is when the BSOL ICS recovery plan was considered at the last meeting, members queried the availability of a wide range of data and or evidence regarding primary care services. ICS has advised they are developing a primary care enabling strategy and it is proposed for this to be considered at the next joint host meeting scheduled on the 15th of February. A major focus of this strategy is ensuring effective data collection arrangements. The ICS has explained the data requested at the last meeting was not available from all GP sites. However, GP locality briefings for all the areas across Birmingham and Solihull have been shared with the members. Can I just confirm that that information will be available for the 15th? Yeah, okay, thank you for that. The next item is the committee's terms of reference, and that's to consider the updated terms of reference for the municipal year 2022 to 2023. And I mean to ask Fiona Vauxhall to introduce that item. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a relatively short report, and hopefully um, self-explanatory. The um, purpose of the report is to update the terms of reference to reflect the change in the NH NHS structure from CCG to the um, the integrated care system, the ICS. Um, so the terms of reference are attached as Appendix 1 to the report. The changes are highlighted in red. Um, so they're relatively straightforward and it, it's the first item on the agenda. So the subsequent items are then carried out under these new terms of reference as it's approved by the committee. Um, it is noted in the report that um, the terms of reference may need to further update during the year when the guidance for health scrutiny is published. Um, at some point in the future, but that isn't available yet. But it was felt that it was important that um, the following discussions with the chair, that this initial update was made so that the terms of reference reflect the current position and can be updated in the future as, um, as and when needed. OK, thank you. Can I ask the committee, are we happy to consider and agree those updated terms of reference? Indeed we are. Yes, thank you much for that. So it's appreciated. Item six is Health Watch Ground Rules Review, announced by on the announcement by the NHS Birmingham Solihull. We've got Richard Burden, who's the chair, and Andy Kay, the chief executive from Health Watch Birmingham and Health Watch Solihull, will present this item. The purpose is 
uh, to seek endorsement of the Birmingham Solihull Joint Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee for the four ground rules proposed by Health Watch Birmingham Solihull. Uh, and the question for members to consider, it, to consider is, do they agree to the correct set, set of ground rules in Appendix 1? So if we can pass over to Richard and Andy, we've got 15 minutes for this. So if we could do five minutes presentation and then possibly 10 minutes of questions. Thank you. And for the opportunity to present these and your support, Randy, and endorse these ground rules. As you've been saying, we've been involved with the Indian Medical Care Committee to the patients around the issue we've raised in that report around UHP. And following that, the announcement of um, the three reviews, we thought it was vitally important that we ask for ground rules to be put in place to build public and patient confidence in the reviews of the ongoing uh, work that UHP and the UHP Four ground rules we focus on that are following. So the reviews must be carried out by people who are transparently independent um, to UHP and the UHP. Um, the, the terms of references for the reviews enable the investigation to go wherever the evidence leads, and that that must not be um, in any way. So the findings of all the reviews must be published in full and with any key reference groups in which Health Watch and others may be invited to take part. And the fourth one, that's actually all recommendations from the reviews are actioned and reviews should not be allowed to gather dust on a shelf and mm -hmm. actually is taken as a result. And actually that, that's communicated to build public confidence and patient confidence in local health and social care services. Those, those four ground rules we think are, are a fair ask of, this, of the system as part of these reviews. Um, as a result, we have also written um, following um, this to the ICB, UHB and NHS England outlining these four um, ground rules and we've had a response uh, from the ICB um, on behalf of UHB as well um, and NHS England in terms of that, um, really supporting um, the areas of transparency um, for them and that um, we will go to the evidence takes it. Um, we're very pleased to be part of the external reference group for this, where actually these four um, ground rules will be part of our function and role in the cross party reference group, which is chaired by MP um, Creed Gill. Um, so this, these ground rules will be used by us and um, throughout the reviews and referenced when the review results are taken into account as well following that. The role of scrutiny, though, is a vital one. Um, so your support and your endorsement of these ground rules is a really great help to us as an organisation and to the public um, to build confidence within these reviews and the action. And the long term, the partnership between us and scrutiny and health brush is an important one to ensure that this happens for local people and then it's not a whole. So I'm happy to stop there and go to questions if that's OK, Chair. OK, thank you. Do you have members have any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for that presentation. Um, I think having looked at these, those ground rules sound very sensible, and um, the importance of independence is not only um, in the pr production of the report, but also in giving people confidence in that, those outcomes. So I think it being seen to be independent is as important as the independence itself. Um, so I can certainly support that. Can you tell me your understanding of UHB or the ICS's response to your request for these ground rules um, and what response you've received from the ICS and from NHS England? Um, because I read the, the letter here responding to that and it didn't seem clear to me whether that was an agreement. Um, it referred to a conversation that you'd had previously. So I'm wondering what your understanding is as to the, the current status of this. Um, yeah, thank, thanks for that. And you're absolutely right about the importance of justice being seen to be done as well as being done, so to speak. So, absolutely endorse that. Um, in relation to the ICB's response, um, we understand from um, what we've been told that the answers are yes to all four of our ground rules. So, I take your point about the letter. It is rather a long, long letter, and I suppose. It is capable of being read in more than one way. 
But after this agenda item, David Melbourne will be giving a report on the review. So hopefully he'll be able to clarify that when he speaks. Um, one caveat I would give is there are three reviews. The one that the ICB is directly commissioning is the first one, which is being led by Mike Buick. The second one into organisational culture at UHB is being primarily commissioned by UHB itself. And the third one into leadership at the Trust is being uh, more directly over by NHS. Um, in relation to the UHB one, the second one on organisational culture, we've yet to have clarification about whether or not they will be agreeing to our four ground rules there. We hope they will, but that's not yet been confirmed. And we don't know anything about the arrangements for that review in terms of who's doing it and so on. On the third one, in relation to the leadership of the Trust, um, we've had a reply from NHS England that expresses sympathy with what we're saying. They've not given an unequivocal yes to our ground rules, he has to be said. And there's still some vagueness about how far the results of that review will be published. Um, so that's something we need to pursue with them. And your support for us on that would be most welcome. Yeah, I think that clarity would be clear better today. That would be fantastic. Um, I did have a follow-up, but I'll come back to that. Yeah, I'm just back up. Uh, thanks, Jay. Yes, it's a simple question. Uh, the four um, ground rules are brilliant. They're solid, they're strong. All rests on the interpretation of the words, of course. So the word independent is a crucial one here. So I wonder if you might want to amplify this community and how they're watching um, how you've interpreted that, that, that word. Uh, in particular, when somebody may have an interest that has a disproportionate influence on their predisposition. Yes, I mean, what we're saying on that, in the letter that we sent to the ICB and others, we were clear that by independent, we mean that, um, that even though the ICB commissions this review, and the other two bodies, NHS England and the and UHB, commission the other two. The personal people carrying them out should not be part of those organisations, and they shouldn't have any personal or commercial relationship with anybody senior at UHB. That's the way we've defined it. Um, we hope that that will be met. After saying this may come up later. There has been some pushback within the last week from a number of the whistleblowers and other staff who've been concerned about things at UHP, and they are not confident that the first review, which is the only one we have any details about, is sufficiently independent. So we've got their letter. It makes some very serious points. We've passed that to the UHP for response, and it will also be considered by the independent and the external reference group that Andy mentioned at its meeting next week. Could you clarify for me on item three of this letter? It says, continue to work with Health Watch Birmingham and Health Watch Solihull to ensure action is taken as a result of these reviews for the people of Birmingham and Solihull. I agree with that in principle, but we should be wary of that predetermines the length of your contract because your services are contracted. Do you have an opinion on that? Um, I, I, I think this is a provider, actually. It's not that, as long as there is a health watch Birmingham or a health watch Solihull, yeah. actually, the results of these reviews should be worked with and the system should be working with whoever the provider is, regardless of who holds that contract. Health watch is an important local role that should be part of this moving forward, regardless of the contracting process. And really to have patients that are hard to pay vital. Yeah, I'm certain that the role will continue, whatever happens. It's just legally, it's difficult to predetermine a contract under those circumstances. Because we would hope any contracting arrangements change in the future, that actually ongoing projects like this that will be in the heart would continue with your hopes for both of We're currently more than happy with your performance. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, certainly. 
have no issue with the ground rules as set, set out. Uh, slightly worrying that you have to ask for a view to be independent and not to be fettered and that will to be published. So, but uh, I certainly have no issue with asking for all of that to make sure it does happen. So, slightly concerned, was it NHS England, said Richard, just haven't yet agreed to that. So, um, slightly worrying that they don't seem to be, well, they're certainly holding back on committing to, to those four things that you've asked for because they seem perfectly reasonable and I can't see why there would be any issue. In respect of item of the fourth ground rule you've asked for in terms of the recommendations, I know it's the scooping process, Chair, but quite often when we carry out an inquiry, there is a tracking of recommendations. And whether it's worthwhile, well, I assume Solihull have a similar arrangement. And um, having a, we as the joint committee have a, a track the recommendations set out from the review, so we can easily monitor that as part of the oversight. And I'll just do the rest of the committee have to support that recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> When you come thank back you. Back. Thank so, you. yes, and thanks to my colleagues. I think um, I've got a sense of what the answer is going to be from those previous responses. Um, I was going to ask that, um, as far as you know so far, um, from what we've been told about that first review, is that consistent with the ground rules that you've set in place um, to your, to the best of your knowledge and, and opinion? To the best of our knowledge, yes. Um, however, you know, we do want that to be confirmed. We are concerned by the pushback that's come from some of the people most affected, because if they don't have confidence in the review, the way it's being set up, or the way it's going about its work, then that is a problem for the reason you identified in the first place. You know, it's got to be seen to be independent. But hopefully, um, yes, it will be, as with all of these things, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. And that's why the role of this external reference group is important. And I have no doubt that if it looks like that review is being fettered in any way from the ground rules that we've set for it, uh, or we've asked to be set for it, then I've got no doubt that external reference group will have something to say about that. Fantastic. I'm aware of some of those concerns, particularly the same ones that you've been made of as well. Um, so the external reference group will be considering this. What's the time scale for that? I'm just a little bit concerned because we're um, approaching the middle of January now. We're looking at the end of January for um, publication of those findings um, according to the time scale. So when is the external reference group going to be considering this? Uh, well, the external reference group will be for the first time next week. Um, uh, I think in terms of the review, I mean, obviously we're not doing the review. It's Mike Buick himself. But I would be really, really surprised if he and his team finished their work by the end of January. I mean, the allegations and the issues that have been raised about UHB are so serious and so detailed that I cannot see you can have the results of a full review within the timescale that's been set. However, I do know that he wants to produce something by the end of January, but I think it's very, very likely he'll be going back to the ICB and saying, these are my findings so far, but there is this, that and the other um, issues that are still outstanding, these lines of inquiry that still need to be pursued and therefore the work should carry on, whether it be by his team or by some other mechanism. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think Councillor Sexton might have asked, you might have answered in part, my impression was about time scales. I support the ground rules, but just in terms of number four, it's just, you know, time scales for a review and time scales for actions. I mean, you talk about, you know, not gathering dust on a shelf. It's just, have you thought that through a bit more in terms of maybe setting time scales? I think it's difficult for us to set time scales. It's need to be done quickly. And I mean, I think why the ICB set it up so rapidly after the news night report. It does need to be done quickly because the concerns are people, I mean, the more that comes out, they've been there for a number of years and therefore the sooner they are tackled, the better. However, because it's really quite some quite complicated issues have arisen just in the course of the last few weeks. You know, I think it's more important to do this thoroughly than to do it quickly. And it shouldn't, but certainly there shouldn't be a and the thing skated over just to meet a time scale. So, you know, my best guess is that um, there will be something produced by the end 
for January. I think we're then probably talking, and again, health warning here, it's not our review, but we're probably talking about a few months to get um, detailed results back for it. As soon as those results come back and the recommendations are made, obviously we can't pre prejudge what those recommendations will be, but that's why we say there should be action to implement those recommendations that's going to be taken without delay after that report. Thank you. Can talk. Thank you. Uh, the fact that you really need to put forward four ground rules, but in essence, look like common sense suggests that the past experience would indicate that it wouldn't ordinarily happen. Uh, is, is that the case? Are there examples that would be used where you feel these four ground rules have not been met uh, in part or in whole? Or are there examples where you feel actually there are uh, reviews that have been completed that where these four rules were applied? No, we, we haven't meant to imply that. Um, and indeed, as soon as we knew what was coming out of the Newsnight report, Andy and I had a meeting straight away with David Melbourne from the ICB. And this was before we published our four ground rules. We verbally put to him then what we would be looking for in terms of an investigation. And verbally, he agreed then. The reason we put it in writing afterwards was partly because I think there is so much about what's been happening at UHP. But as to the problem of who said what to who when, we thought it was really important to get it on the record, first what our ask was on that, but also to get on record without ambiguity the ICB's response to that, UHB's response to that, and NHS England's response to that. So it's partly about creating an audit trail. And we also knew that as far as the number of the whistleblowers concerned, and others have expressed concern, the call has been for a full statutory public inquiry of the kind that was set up in relation to mid-staffs. Now, we don't in any way close the door on that. And if the reviews that has been set up does not meet, you know, meet what is required, certainly I think we'll probably be one of those that are saying what is needed is something like a mid-staffs inquiry. But that's why we wanted to put it on the record now, to show what the absolute minimum have got to be for anybody to have confidence in these reviews. Next, um, my question's about timescales. I think, you know, we're, we're all quite worried about the timescales. I'm sure my colleagues would agree. Um, obviously, you know, we want we want the reviews done appropriately, you know, in a good time, timely fashion. What's what are you, what's going to be done about keeping this on top of the agenda? Um, you know, so as, as my colleague said, it's not left on the shelf somewhere. Um, so have you got any plans to, you know, keep keep going back to it in certain times today? I will say even if people have not come back with, with answers that you've wanted, I just wondered what the way forward is there. We'll be certainly constantly monitoring this all the way through as Health Watch. Um, we are just one of those monitoring now. I mean, our role and our locus is patients and the public. I mean, that's our core mission. And obviously the allegations here goes a lot further. I mean, all of them end up back at what impact does this have on patient care? But it does go beyond our remit as well. That's why, I mean, I have no doubt that there will be others that will be monitoring it as well. Certainly, I think Preet Gill will be doing so. Her external reference group will be really, really vital to that. And you will be as well, you know, I mean, um, I think we've all got a job of work to do on this. Yeah, I note that residents and councillors' comments, concerns will be fed in by a cross-party reference group. Are we clear that those are going to be fed verbatim to the next uh, level? In, into the review group themselves? Um, and is there a deadline? Do we know when these, this meeting group is going to meet to consider these? Well, the cross-party reference group hasn't yet met, but <clears throat> my understanding and indeed the terms of reference of it have not yet 
been made available either. Um, and again, we are not running that cross-party reference group. But my understanding is that its role be, will be one of scrutiny. You know, so I, I know in terms of what the ICD said is to have an input in the group. And I'm sure the reference group will have in terms of saying, have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? But that reference group is not going to be part of the review. It's going to be part of the scrutiny mechanism to make sure that the review does what it needs to do. Yeah, I just not want to be clear that I uh, support the uh, recommendations of your letter that the, this review should be unfettered in any way, that these uh, residents' characteristics concerns will go through the process unfettered in any way. I hope so, but, I mean, but certainly the reference group is not a way of filtering those. You know. Can we recommend that as a... Yeah. Councillor McCarthy, it may be useful that issues regarding the timescale and the, the reference group get picked up in the next section that David Melbourne and Jonathan Brotherton will, will will be presenting. So maybe we could come back to that question with with at the next item. And then if we still haven't got a a, a, concern, a result which reflects the committee's concerns, we could we could revisit it. One thing I would say on that is that the first con the only conversation I've had so far with Mike Buick, who's running the review, he's made it clear that anybody can put evidence direct to him, and he's happy to have his personal email disseminated, which we've been doing. So that's why I say we don't, neither us nor the external reference group, whilst I'm sure both of us would want to help anybody put forward evidence if they want to do so. They don't need, we don't need to mediate that or moderate that evidence can go straight to the review, and there's got to be assurances that if it does go in, it'll be treated with the confidence that uh, that's needed. It's part of the role of scrutiny to see that we're confident that that has happened as we follow this through. Next, do you have any further questions for, uh, for Andy and Richard? No. Okay. Are we happy to endorse the ground rules set out in Appendix 1 from, from our watch? Okay. Thank you, thank, thank you all for that. The next item is number seven, which is independent reviews at University Hospital Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. We've got David Melbourne, ICB Chief Exec, and Jonathan Brotherton, the Interim uh, Chief Executive from UHB NHS Foundation Trust. The purpose of today is further to the news night and other media coverage in December of 2022 relating to alleged concerns regarding patient safety, leadership, culture, governance, in particular with regards to University Hospital Birmingham, uh, NHS Hospital, NHS Birmingham, Solial ICB had agreed three independent reviews. Uh, and the paper we got is summarising the progress to date. So, uh, I think we want to go across to David and Jonathan to expand on that for us. Go give the uh, give that computation by EA some bits of slide for the reviews on. Um, I can find it in my email. Do you think you want to make it start off? No, exactly. It was distributed. Yeah, it was distributed. yeah no, I think it was distributed already, but uh, I'll talk, talk through that for Mike. But if I can just give this some context, uh, University Hospitals Birmingham provide the majority of the care, uh, secondary care for citizens in our city. There's over 22,000 staff there, uh, 1,200 uh, consultants. It's one of the largest uh, health providers in the country and in the world. And the majority of the care there is high quality care. I wouldn't want people going away from here thinking uh, that, that, uh, that that isn't the case. And certainly, there's no doubt that we as an NHS have got to uh, high that look at the issues that have been raised by the Newsnight programme. Um, but I do think that one of my jobs is to make sure there's confidence in the NHS locally and the majority of the care that is done through all our system is high quality care. However, saying that, we have commissioned three reviews or three reviews have been commissioned in um, you've got this in the pack, but this, this is a schematic of showing what those reviews are. Now, um, the first one, the first two, the culture review and the well-led review, um, and I'll explain what each of those are. We have decided internally in the NHS to 
to, to do those two independent reviews prior to the new company. Yeah. Absolutely clear, those were decided prior to the Newsnight programme. They weren't in response to. We knew we had issues to, to sort out, and I'll take you through each one. What is a well-led review? Well, a well-led review looks at the governance of uh, a healthcare organisation, and it actually links in to the methodology that the CQC use when they come and review organisations. You will probably see CQC reports about all our healthcare organisations across Birmingham and Surrey Hall. It looks at, at how it's governed, how does the board work, how do the subcommittees work, but also how it's run. And that, P, and, and, and that review is being taken by a range of experts from across NHS England, none of whom are local to Birmingham and none of whom are in that hospital. That report will go to Jonathan and go to Danny Buckland, the interim chair and the interim chief exec. Uh, but, and, and those types of reviews, most organisations will have them at some point in, I mean, it's every three or four years you have those. But it's good to take stock of that and learn from them. And Jonathan might want to talk about some of the work he's already doing in preparation for that review. Um, the second one is a culture review, and this takes longer to, to actually assess and understand the culture in an organisation. The culture, if you type, talk to leaders such as Mike Buick, um, is so important to live in high quality care um, for patients. Um, and that is going to be commissioned, externally commissioned, by Dave Eve Buckland. So it will not be somebody who's undertaking. Nobody at the trust or in the system will be under, uh, who undertakes that review will will be involved in actually doing the review. So there's a clear independence there. It will report to, to Eve, Dave Eve Buckland, and to Jonathan again. Um, then the third review is the issue around patient safety. And I was as shocked as everybody when I heard the Newsnight um, sort of uh, report uh, just before Christmas. And therefore, that's when we, says, we decided to actually look at the patient safety review. And that specifically focuses on those allegations made in Newsnight. There were six allegations in Newsnight, and it specifically focuses on those allegations. I thought it was really important to do two things. That was independent. Nobody, nobody involved in that review worked in Birmingham or worked or has worked at UHB. So I think that's really important to put on the record. The second one, I thought it was clear at the outset that that review needs to be clinically led. And what I didn't want is uh, a management consultancy firm coming in to do that. Um, and therefore, we needed a very senior clinician, someone who's not worked in the system, preferably, um, so we could avoid those accusations of bias or vested interests. And uh, Mike Buick actually ticks all those boxes. So they're their three reviews. Now, as I said, our intent initially was to do the first two and not the second one. Now, I do recognise, and I've talked to Mike on a regular basis, that it's important that he may well find things in his initial review that he has to refer on to either the well-led reviewers or the cultural reviewers. As Richard says, there's a, you know, these are big issues that need to be sorted out, and he will make recommendations. I spoke to him uh, yesterday. He will be making recommendations by the end of January. Uh, as Richard said, there might be more work to be done after that. What he's also committed to do is to come back um, in May to see whether those recommendations have been implemented. So independently, we can do that. Um, but I, I think that's that's important. I, I recognise what colleagues around the table said about timeliness. And I've got no apologies for the speed at which we commissioned or I commissioned that that last review. Um, it's imperative to me, given what I was hearing in the media, that we acted at appropriate speed. And I'm sure if I'd not done that, I'd have been criticised the other way for not doing that, for dragging my feet effectively. So it's a balance between the two, and that's what I've, uh, that's what I've looked to do in terms of timeliness. Um, and I thought it was important to go that extra mile. Um, and I think it is 
perfectly in the boundaries of good governance, so three reviews, to undertake those and report them through our normal processes, through um, processes that with Health Watch, with the OSC, through the World Health and Wellbeing Boards, through our own internal governance processes in the NHS. Remember, our quality committee is uh, at the ICB is uh, chaired by uh, Professor Liz Hughes, who's a consultant, uh, independent to this system. So she she would get that report anyway. But I thought it was more important that we went that extra mile. And that's why uh, the reference group chaired by Preet Gill have been working with her to make sure that we've got that additional transparency, that we've got that reference group. Now, the terms of reference are with Preet at the moment. I don't want to overly influence those. So she has helped develop those terms of reference and they will be available I think, if not the end of this week, early next week, but they're being considered on the meeting um, on the 26th of January, of January of that reference group. And just to say that reference group includes um, local politicians. It includes Karen Grinsell from, uh, as chair of Health and Wellbeing Board at Solihull. It includes Councillor Marion Khan as Health and Wellbeing Board chair uh, in Birmingham. I've asked for a, a local Conservative MP as well as a, a Labour MP to get that political balance. I still haven't got there. Uh, I've asked Preet to help me with that. And we've asked Steve Barclay if he can help us with that also. Um, it includes um, professional representatives from trade, from the trade unions, from the RCN and from the BMA. Um, and it also includes an expert from EY, um, Ernst Young, on governance in public services, one of their top partners, who treat you, I didn't know. Um, so I, I'm, I'm convinced that, as well as health watch colleagues as well, it doesn't include anybody from my team or from Jonathan's team. So uh, we, we have tried to make sure there is full independence there. And then there were some questions earlier about how can people feed into that. There was a virtual town hall session, I think the details are on the slide that, that we sent out on the 23rd of January. And that gives an opportunity for citizens to raise concerns, who've raised it with their MP, to uh, to actually tell the review team. But also, Dame Eve and, and Jonathan have, have met with local councillors in, in, in Birmingham, and they've been very clear that if there are any constituents who want to raise anything, just to contact them, and they'll pass those, those concerns through to, uh, to sort of uh, Mike Buick as well. And Mike has had a range of people who have contacted him. I've had a range of people who have contacted me and I've just passed those on to, to Mike as well. Um, so I, our whole intent here is to be transparent, to be open. But I think that now we've commissioned these reviews, there has to be less of a focus on looking for a scapegoat or, 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 or looking for somebody within the NHS. The NHS at the moment is under extreme pressure and we need to be able to get on and deliver services whilst also giving the confidence by doing these reviews. I think working with Health Watch, working with local council, um, local councils, working with NHS England, we will be able to do that. Um, I think the only other issue that you raised was where our NHS England on it. I can't speak for them, but I work very closely with them. Um, I, I think the, uh, where they are is that they would want the ICB to make sure that we uh, manage this locally as far as is practicable. We, you know, we are the local people, we manage the system, and we shall hear from local politicians, from local stakeholders, what their views are. Now, the reason that NHS England have got involved is they are one of the regulators. Uh, along with the CQC um, for providers. And that's the reason they've got involved in the well-led review. And the final thing I'd say, Councillor, is that we are talking to the CQC about this as well and about their role in this. So, um, you know, hopefully we have ticked every box there, but we're always happy to learn, or always happy to do something else. But I think it's important we get something out in the next two or three weeks, at least as a start, you know, from Mike's review, at least to provide you with some uh, some heads up. And that's why, um, you know, it's so important that we link into the OSC meetings and make sure that we can see when we can come back on those OSC meetings and talk to you about those. But we report this through 
The, the initial report from Mike Buick will go to our quality committee, which is independently chaired. Um, we will obviously make that available to a uh, reference group, and there's a reference group meeting on the 7th of February, which Mike is attending, with his first findings and recommendations. So, uh, we will be in reference to the, the virtual town hall session on the 23rd, uh, how do people actually link into that? Will be publicly given in terms of how you people would want to make contact with that. And then the second point would be in terms of councillors who may have questions flagged up through their men, through their, their residents. What's the contact point on the cross party reference group? Do they go straight to pre court or yeah. is there a separate contact? So, so, so I don't, so I think people can go through pre group, but it, effectively, I think it's through Mike Pickens Bridge, it's run through Mike Buick because Mike Buick is doing the review. If people want to, I pr would prefer that he hears direct from the individuals. In terms of the links in, to how, how do you link into that virtual town hall session? I have to say, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure here. I'd have to get back to you, and I can get back to you very quickly to say how how you can do that. The um, the people who go into that virtual town hall session are the uh, who've been invited. Are the 50 people who Preet Gill has highlighted, plus any other colleagues that have. I, I said I've, I've got a number of people who'd, who'd come to me. Um, there are other people who've contacted Mike Buick direct. It's those people who've been. Um, invited to those meetings. Mike has also said that if people aren't comfortable in talking in an open forum, he will speak from one-to-one. -one. You'll get those contacted. I'll, I'll get them because I don't know them off the top of my head. I wonder if we could have the details for that and also the direct contact details um, mm. circulated. Um, yeah. As, thank you. Yeah. Along with the terms of reference, so very good to put the two together. Yeah, Councillor McCarthy, the terms of reference aren't with me, they are with Preet Gill to, to sign off, so I'll, I'll, I'll push her to do it, but, uh, but they've been with her. But for the public, they need to fit together, otherwise we'll... They do. Uh, we, you know, we have published the terms of reference for Mike Buick's, uh, you know, that they, they are in the Mike Buick review. The reference group, um, I'm, I'm in the hands of, of Preet at the moment, so I'll push on that. Now I understand... I think it's probably right after the meeting with um, the first meeting on the 26th, we probably, because it's got to be agreed by the reference group itself on the 26th. So I assume it's going to be agreed there and then we can put this up. Okay, Councillor Moore. Uh, thank you, Chair. Councillor Quinn, I'm sorry, I was going to raise was about the actual town hall sessions because I've, I've heard that there's been talk about them and this cross party group but no details of how any member of the public can engage with it so far I've seen so um, and if it's meant to be a vehicle of engagement it's going to be pretty poor <laughs> no one can actually know how to join you or how to feed into it so I think it's really really important those details are shared um, and my other point is it's something I to the councillors briefing that was given last time is about engagement with local councillors is more than the cabinet member the NHS seems to think they tell the cabinet member something and that's engagement with councillors and that's not the case certainly Birmingham is under one of us there's not one um, I don't have their own side of it, but an equal, a similar number of councillors rather than just the cabinet members. So the NHS is frequently not engaged at a local level with councillors and quite often it's just done it at a higher level within local authorities. So just a plea to make sure that as part of this, it's going to everyone. All our email addresses are publicly, so there's no reason for us not all to be included. Now, I appreciate not everyone will have the time or commitment to take part, but it's important that we're made aware of that rather than just simply we'll let the cabinet member know, job done. Uh, no, I, I, I know that. I mean, that's why we had uh, Councillor Moore. You know that session, those two sessions last week, last week or the week before. I can't quite remember when it was. Well, those sessions, it talked about the engagement with councillors, but it just in the cabinet members. So mm -hmm. that was my point. It's more than just the cabinet members. Before I bring Councillor Mackenzie, I just wanted to ask this is a sort of follow on question for Councillor Moore's question. In, I was thinking in terms of South and Heard communities, if it's proper, if people such as local counters aren't sure in terms of how to contact this and get their views, but it would be more hard, more hard to reach your South and Heard communities actually being engaged with. Yeah. So, um, 
I, so the purpose of the Buick review is very clear. So we need to be clear about why people want to uh, want to sort of be in touch with my the, the, the terms of reference for public, they can agree with my and share them with health watch. This isn't a, a, a this isn't a engagement about everything that's happening in the specific to the industry. So I think we need to be clear on that. Or we make a review on the doable that the client's going to do. Because the danger is we say everybody can come and people will complain, probably rightly, that they've been waiting too long for an operation or you know, this went wrong when they were uh, at the hospital. But this isn't about that. This is specifically about what was in the terms of reference that we sent out on the paper. So I think, I think Chair, what I, I'm happy to do is send those details of Mike, because Mike will have these records in terms of reference. Otherwise, we get into a position where it's just unmanageable because there's an NHS. Because here we get hundreds of emails that should probably be going to the power service at UHV or going to the complaint service or coming to me as a complaint or going, you know, going to the parliamentary ombudsman. So we need to make sure we're not going around those those processes that are in place throughout the fact that everything it is specific to these issues um, that, that we've done that. So, and again, I say that with council as well. So I think it's, it's understanding what that view of view is about. Um, but I will make sure that people have got my view email address. I'll make sure um, that people know how to get onto that uh, virtual town hall. Um, I think, again, Preet is managing the, or Preet's officer managing the, um, uh, 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 managing the sort of arrangements around that. So I just have to need to make sure I get in touch with her. And sort of Mackenzie. When you first started speaking, you said you were shocked about the details of the program. Mm. I think if anybody has been using the NHS or having family members as I have, that you wouldn't be shocked because that's how it was. Um, unfortunately. And he was from residents as well, saying exactly the same horror stories, which is really bad. And on the um, bike during um, review, I googled it in case it had come out early. So but on there, when, we, when I googled it, a report done a third week, BERWICC. Different individual, yeah. yeah. A review. And in that review, it talked about patient safety, dumping levels. Um, transparency, service accountability, and that was in 2013. So nobody taken any notice of that review that was done and and possibly um, stating the same ideals as what the next review will be. I'm just trying to, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find out what that, that review was. Don't... I think it's that yeah, Staffordshire. So, so the Don Burke, Don Burke is an American uh, sort of uh, clinician who is an expert in quality. Um, so um, now, clearly, Mike Buick does understand. I mean, he did the the, the reviews at Morecambe Bay, for example. He understands all those issues that Don Don Burwick would have highlighted elsewhere. So he does understand that. And if a mind counselor can just go back to to what I was shocked about. I think we have to distinguish between two things. What was claimed and the allegations in that Newsnight review, which we are looking into, and the experience that many of our citizens have of the NHS. And I know that, that um, if you went from the top of the NHS all the way through to the leadership in the NHS, we will say that December was incredibly challenging. We had... Um, you know, we 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 coming back from. We had flu, we had COVID, we had industrial action. We, you know, we had record levels of demand. We know we're not where we want to be. But let, let me just give you some assurances. Birmingham and Solihull is one of the fastest improving systems in terms of um, its cancer weights, in terms of its over seventy eight week weights, and other areas. That's not saying we've not got a lot to do. But I want to continue to stress 
that there is confidence in the local NHS. We've got some fantastic teams. Uh, incredibly hard to do. Yeah, yeah. And we've got industry action again next uh, ne- next week. And we have to navigate that for our patients safely. So I hear what you say, but the experience of the NHS, whether it's, and we've talked about this here and the chair mentioned it earlier, but it's the trying to get to see a GP at 8 o'clock in the morning, whether it's waiting for cancer care or waiting for planning care. But we have to make it in those areas. I know the lived experience of many people is not great, and that includes in mental health services as well. And you know, my job is to help improve that. We've we've been in place literally five months, uh, so we're looking to do that. But we need to distinguish between that and the allegations that I was shot on. Okay, Councillor Sexton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a number of questions on on this report. Um, I wonder if we can. Go through them. Um, the first one was you mentioned that the reviews were in process before the news night. Well, so, can I ask what the stimulus was for setting up the reviews if it wasn't the allegations that were made um, on that news night programme? Yeah. I mean, I've, uh, Councillor Sexton, I've, I've been open with this. I've said it at our board meetings, which in public. Um, I've also said it, I think it's one of the council's meetings that, that we've had. Um, the NHS has a process of governance that looks at all its providers. Um, and already there were some issues with UHV that we knew within UHV and outside UHV that we had to look at. And we, we have a process where NHS England have board to board meetings with the local integrated care board, with the provider and the NHS board. And it was that meeting which then set the requirement for a well led review and set the requirement for a, a, a view into culture because our our assessments at the time was that was what was required now what we've added to that is something else the Buick review into those specific issues of safety and he will feed into those other reviews as well and he will come back and he will tell us if we've done what we said we've done if we can just go through the, the document that we've sent, um, it may seem like a little bit of nitpicky, but on page 27, um, where we talk about recognise the immediacy of the situation, both to reassure the public of quality of care and also if any immediate action required. I'm a little bit concerned about the phrasing of that, and I wonder whether that somewhat prejudges the outcome of the um, because um, reassurance is important, but it's also important that that is based on um, a realistic appraisal of what the current situation actually is. And prior to having the findings from that review, um, it's not clear to me whether reassurance is the appropriate first step. Um, so I'm a little bit concerned that it seems to be being phrased in a way that suggests that that's the likely outcome. Um, so that's my first question. I'll, um, I'll go through a couple of things, and maybe you can come back. Um, the second one was on page 28, um, item three that talks about the review um, a consideration of the trust response to staff deaths and the tragic suicide um, recently um, that, that was recently found by the coroner. It mentions here appropriate support and training in context of death and suicide, it doesn't mention general mental health support. Um, and I'm wondering whether there should also be something they're talking about, mental health support that's available to staff members who may be struggling, even in the absence of a suicide to prompt that. Um, because obviously by the time that's happened, that's a little bit late. We want people, staff members to be able to access that prior to reaching that terrible stage. Um, so I'm wondering if that needs a little bit of looking at there. Um, and the final one I'm going to ask in this batch is on page 30, it talks about um, a group co-chairing um, or co- co-chaired between NHS England and the NHS Birmingham and Solihull group, and that would only be the programme work. Can I ask what steps are being taken to ensure that that group in particular is as independent as possible from UHB. Um, and the context for that is that 
as we talked about earlier with the health, the health watchers request, it's being seen to be independent that's important. And we're in this room, we're all aware that there are a number of links between UHB and ICS and people who've been employed at, um, at both. And I think it's important to make sure that the group that are looking at this in particular are seen to be as independent as possible from anything that might have gone on that's being looked at by the review. So. Thanks, Councillor Sexton. Um, so if I go to your first point about reassurance, there's, there's nothing meant one way or the other in that. I can just assure you that, um, you know, that the, it's probably the wording rather than anything else. Sure. So, so apologies if, if that came across. I'll, I'll, for, for, I'll will mention to Mike when I see him next week about the general mental health support at three for staff. So I think you can look into that as well. In terms of independence, now we are not unique, and I, I am not going to be an apologist for this. I'm not unique in having senior staff drawn from our broader system. There are 40,000 staff in the NHS locally, 22,000 of those are at UHB. Um, so what I have committed to is making sure, as I said, the state, uh, I've actually had to give a statement to the press and uh, I, I'll make it here that none of my colleagues who have worked at UHP will be involved in any of these reviews or in that oversight group. So, the, so there will not be any colleagues doing that. Um, but what I'm not going to do is apologise for having high quality individuals working for me who've previously worked at UHC. Sure. I'm, I appreciate in this context that is to some degree inevitable. Um, it's just making sure that in looking at this particular item, that independence is maintained as much as possible. Um, one final point for now. Um, how have UHB staff been contacted to ask them to feed into the review? Um, because I'm aware that a lot of the... Um, the allegation it's to do with the, the culture amongst staff and how staff are being treated. Um, and I mean, I've heard from a number of UHB staff who had stories to tell me. Obviously, it wouldn't be appropriate to recount those anecdotes in this context. But how are those people being given the opportunity to, to feed that in? So um, we've said that they can get in touch with Mike Buick. Um, I'll, I'll go back and make sure that Mike Buick... Um, is you know his email is available. However, can I, as I said previously, the Buick review, you know, the scope of it is the scope of it. It is not so. The we when you've got twenty two thousand staff, not all those staff are going to be happy, and therefore we have to make sure that if, if we open that up, it makes the whole thing undoable. As I said about the the uh, about the local population. Isn't that we don't need to listen to staff? And I'm sure that Jonathan will talk about the work that he and Eva are doing since they became, you know, a new leadership has gone into the in, into UHB. Um, the work that they've been doing in listening to staff. Uh, you know, for me, what I'm trying to do is provide a forum to listen to to to, to listen to patients, to listen to our population. But I think Jonathan's doing that actually mirroring that and Eve Buckland within UHB because what we've seen and the feedback we've seen independently is a difference in approach and I don't know Jonathan whether you want to just talk about some of the work that you've been doing. Yeah. Sure, good afternoon everyone, hope you can hear me okay, I'm not sure where the microphone is, I think it's behind there. So um, I mean I've been in the organisation, this is my ninth year, um, almost all of that time as the Ops Director and more latterly as the Deputy Chief Exec since April last year, and then as the Interim Chief Exec on the 1st of January this month. Um, and Jamie Eve Buckland has joined as Interim Chair at the same time. And we are taking this moment in time to try to speak to as many people, not both, we are speaking to as many people as we possibly can for a couple of reasons. One, there is clearly a strength of feeling that exists that needs to be heard. It needs to be brought to the surface, heard, understood, and then acted upon. The second reason is that there are many of our staff who are concerned about the impact of the negative coverage about the organisation at the moment that's in the media, that's being talked about as part of everything we're discussing today, how that's impacting on the public, 
in their confidence to access services with the hospital. Our own patients currently who are under our treatment and people that have perhaps been under our treatment in the past and wondering whether everything was okay. Um, and we need our staff to be on top four during the difficult times that David's just outlined for the whole NHS. This is one of the toughest periods that I've faced in my long career in NHS operation in terms of the pressures. We need to make sure we're doing everything we can to support them through this difficult time, both difficult in terms of the demands upon them because of the, uh, you know, the demands on healthcare that we face, but also the, um, the reporting about the organisation and some of the things that we're being told. So we're doing our best to address all three of those things at the same time. What we're very clear about, though, is that when it comes to the cultural review that they, they need as a commission, that we need some independent um, uh, uh, support with delivering that. So she is in the process of identifying an organisation to come in and oversee that culture review to make sure that everybody gets the chance to speak up through whatever route they feel most comfortable speaking up in, whether that's confidentially or whether that is in person or however that may be. So we will provide a variety of routes by which people can share their experiences, thoughts, and any concerns that they've got. And then we will take that information, as we're already doing, but continue to build upon that in order to inform what we need to do going forward. And all of that is it's got quite a lot of overlap, as David's described, with the patient safety review in the the terms of reference are in the back, and any learn anything that's learned from that patient's head review will be spread across into the cultural review and also the well led review as well. So, we're doing our best to tie all of those together at the same time um, and provide the opportunity to people. Fantastic, thank you. And I can fully appreciate what you're doing there, and I, I think it's important to get that sense from staff. Um, at the same time, I'm aware that some of the allegations have been around whistleblowing and how whistleblowers are treated. So I could understand if there were staff members who didn't necessarily feel comfortable talking to somebody within the organisation. So I think what you said about making sure there's an external organisation where staff members can be confident that that's being treated confidentially um, is really important. And also, I think making sure that the the message is got out to everyone so that they are aware that this is taking place and they know how to feed in anything or any concerns that they may have. Um, I think that's what I, I'm, I'm looking for that assurance. So thank you. Okay. Can I just raise one point before I bring Councillor Pocock in on the point of the council that sex to me about staff counselling? I would have assumed that if, because I understand there's a staff counselling service at UHP where you can either email them or telephone to arrange an appointment. I would have assumed that that information had been treated in confidence anyway. Yeah. 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 Okay, so thank you for that clarification. The second point would be in terms of, are you able to give us some indication in terms of whether that service has had a spike in referrals over, over recent times? You may not know that information now, but it'd be useful if you could, if you could actually find that out. Yes, we can have a look into that for you. We do have a range of services that are available for staff to speak up whether that's the freedom to speak up, guarding them and 30 confidential contacts, whether it's to our patient health services, which can either be a manager-led referral or a self-referral for any of our 22,000 staff. And there are a number of other health and wellbeing initiatives that we've put in place over the last few years, most notably in response to the impact on people from dealing with the pandemic, but also um, the, some of the more recent tragic events that have been reported in the media that we have stepped up further the uh, support available to people but we also know that those services need further development and enhancement and we've made some commitments to do that as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Pocock. Thanks Jane. I think the first report or maybe an interim report, there's more work to be done on the first review at the end of January. Um, what are your proposals for a communications media launch of this, in particular, launching it in a public way that allows media to um, ask questions and others of us might want to also um, look through and ask you to comment on that report? Getting confidence in that first report is crucial to there being confidence in the further reports down the line. So that very first agenda setting um, release, if you like, of your first initial findings is crucial to that um, um, trust and relationship. So I'm looking here to how you intend to handle the inevitable 
media focus and the interests of many of us in actually being present and being able to ask questions and clarifications on that report when it first disseminated. And also to be able to have seen the draft before then being presented with the opportunity to query it. So we do have a, uh, a plan around uh, that, uh, around how we will launch that and how we will engage with communities in that. That plan needs to be um, worked through with the reference group to make sure the reference group is comfortable with that. Um, and um, I am, we ha do have some constraints in that uh, Mike Buick actually goes away for three weeks from the 9th of February. So I, I need, I've got quite a short window to do that in. Um, if we need Mike, and I would like Mike there as well. As I said, it's important to clinically led. He's there to respond to that. He has a team working with him, so it might be some of Mike's team. So we're working through the details of that at the moment. Um, I, I Over the next week, I expect those to be landed. Okay, point. We've only 10 days to go to the 30th of yeah. January. So um, I appreciate the fine meeting on Mike, but not as well. But maybe you can reassure this community for the principle that there will be in terms of which there will be any published reports and the mechanism for people to query, please investigate further, ask questions uh, in the context of that release. Yeah, so there'll be a published report. I've always said the report will be published. Um, the opportunity for it to be with the, the the process for that opportunity we need to work i need i'm, I'm not saying i'm saying yes we will have that opportunity i need to work through what that process is so once it's published there will be a process where people can come back on that i don't have the detail of that because we're working through at the moment and then the logistics of that i just need to work through so remember i told you earlier that this report will go in draft to the reference committee on the 7th uh, of February. I just need to work through the logistics of what happens after that, given the, the, the person who's leading the report is in the States for three weeks after then. So I just need to work that through. So this final result there could be circulated once that decision made this committee then circulated. I just make of one final piece of feedback um, because I know we've discussed this previously as this committee. Um, in terms of the psychological support available to staff, um, I appreciate that that's available, and I'm I'm, I'm grateful for you confirming that. Um, there appears to be a perception amongst at least some staff um, that psychological support is difficult to access, and I mean that's based on my very informal survey of. Um, NHS staff who I come into contact with my day-to-day -day job or um, during a brief period last year when I was uh, enjoying UHB's hospita hospitality. Um, but having spoken to a few people, there seems to be a perception that it's difficult to access. So I, I don't know whether that's an accurate perception or not, um, but one way or another, it seems to me that that could perhaps be communicated to staff um, more effectively. Thank you. Good. Uh, thanks very much. Um, just going back to the start of the discussion and um, our four ground rules, I think in relation to the patient safety review, um, even though concerns have been expressed by a number of the whistleblowers and others about whether it is sufficiently independent and transparent, I think it can at least be said that in relation to the flowchart that David Melbourne has provided, it is clear who's doing it. It is clear within the ICB who will be monitoring that from the ICB's point of view. And it's clear that there will be this external reference group. Now, whether those are adequate, you know, let's see. But at least it's clear what's there. In relation to the second and third reviews, I have to say, I've got no such confidence. We know that they are, we've been told they're going to be external, but there's still no detail that guarantees their independence. There's very little in terms of their transparency and no detail in terms of who actually will be charged with responding to their recommendations. Um, 
you know, we know that the concerns that have been expressed at UHP, there were some new ones in the Newsnight report, but only some. Some of what came out in that health watch has been raising for the best part of 18 months. Um, we know that they've been raised, we've been raising with the trust, with the Care Quality Commission, and to some extent publicly in response to CQC reports and so on. We know that Unison put a detailed dossier to the Care Quality Commission in the summer of 2021, which actually echoed an awful lot of the things that subsequently came out in the Newsnight report. And we know that in the autumn of 2021, UHB's own Speak Up Guardian reported from his survey that 50% of the employees that he surveyed said that they would be worried about detriment if they spoke up about concerns they had about the way the trust runs. Now, the reason I say all that now is what we've been told today is those second and third reviews will be processed through the NHS's normal mechanisms. Now, I have to say, I'm not confident that's good enough. You know, an awful lot of people, I have to say, myself included, are asking the question now. If so many people knew so many bits and pieces of what came out in the Newsnight report, at least 18 months, sometimes longer than that, before that Newsnight report came out, what were the institutions of the NHS doing about it? What was the UHB government's process doing about it? And what were other elements of the supervisory structure of the NHS doing about it? And, you know, these are really important matters for debate. I don't want to prejudge the results of any of these reviews, but this is precisely why we wanted to put those four ground rules on the record. Independence, transparency, going where the evidence leads, and acting on those recommendations. So we really do need more, I think, about those second and third reviews. We need to know who's going to do them, how are they going to be guaranteed they're going to be independent, who is going to look at them, is there going to be the same kind of independent oversight process in relation to the second and third reviews that there is in relation to the first review, and will the findings be published? And if the answer to any of those is there anything less than an unequivocal yes, then I, for one, have got problems with it. Okay, uh, Richard, in terms of the second review on the cold review, we know that's being commissioned by Eve Auckland. Are you able to expand a little bit in terms of the question points that Richard raised? So, um, I think that I need to go back and make sure, having heard what everybody said here, Chair, that we take on board the second and third reviews, some of those concerns. I've already talked to Pre Gill about this, um, so she has some of those concerns as well. Um, and I've already talked to Mike Buick about it, and I've talked to Eve about it, Eve Buckland about it. Um, one of my, and it's an emerging thought, is how can I use the independence, or how can we, as a NHS use the independence of Mike to oversee all three of those reviews to bring that overview of all of them. And that's something that I can't commit to at the moment, but it's, it's a thought. Um, and I think one of the reasons why the culture review and well led review, uh, there isn't quite the clarity there is on the patient safety one, is that we've not yet got the terms of reference, we've not yet commissioned somebody. Once we've got that, we will be able to actually put those out there and show what's happening. So um, I'm not aware of any reticence to uh, to actually share the findings of the well-led review or the court review, but I would need to check that. They're not, they're not my reviews. There's something that a provider is doing within our system, but I'm not I'm not I'm not aware of any reticence to share the findings of those reviews. Okay, we've got the committee meets again on the 15th of March, I think, not March, February. So would those details be available by then? Well, that the well led is with NHS England. I would think that they would be available, but it's not, okay. I'm probably not doing that. It's NHS yeah. England that are doing that well led review with us. So that's their review of us. Um, the culture review, then the reason that 
the details aren't available today is because it's still being worked through. So as soon as it's available, then the details will be shared to answer the yeah. questions that have just been raised or the points that have just been raised. So whether that's the 15th of February or a, a different date, I'm not quite sure, but I will certainly feed back to the chair um, this afternoon to see if we could get that ready for the 15th yeah. of February. If you, if, if you could do that, I think the committee would appreciate that. And then if you sort of let yeah. me, Joseph and, and Gail Mo what's happening on that and if we've got that information available to bring it to the, meet, the meeting on the 15th. Councillor Harris? Just on the culture review, because if you look at skin attic, it talks about January 2023, but presumably what we mean there is that's launching your that, you're yes. working through that process. It's not yeah. that it's going to be done in January, it's no, just no. starting that process. Yeah. And you haven't got an end date as yet. And the scope of the review is being worked through at the moment. There are external organisations that specialise in this that we are that the chair is speaking with to be able to understand which one can best support. What's the best scope of the review? How do we make sure it's extensive enough um, to, to, to be appropriate? And then, of course, that will inform the timescales that are involved um, and uh, what we can report back and when it can be reported back. But I, there, there is no reason why the findings of any such review wouldn't be made available um, in the public interest, in public knowledge, because um, that's the right thing to do. Just to say, Chair, um, in terms of, I, I was keen to make sure we did this first review with Mike, because as I said right at the start, some of the things that he, find, he finds, they need to feed in some of the terms of reference for the culture and moral review as well. So he will make some recommendations, I've got no doubt, and they will feed into those more in depth reviews as well. What we'll uh, undertake to do is for February meeting, come back and address those issues about um, that Richard has said about the oversight overall. Does that continue to be the reviews? I need to work that through with colleagues. Um, but also, uh, if we've got that detail about those individual reviews, we will provide that to you. So if you can find that information out and then feed it through to the scrutiny team, they can, uh, they can disseminate that information out in advance of the 15th. Yeah. 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 <coughs> Any more questions, members? Yeah. If there's a notation down that we need to be looking at about endorsing the arrangements for three independent reviews uh, launched by MHS, Birmingham, Solly or ICB and University Hospital Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust, would we actually feel confident enough to actually endorse all three independent reviews at this particular stage? Yeah, I've got a concern, I think, um, Mr. Burnham, this point, I'd be happy to be done. Yeah. Great. We go on the, on the notation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. There's uh, another note to say that we've invited the the attendees today back to a meeting of joint TOSC on the 13th of March, which will be held here at two o'clock. Uh, but, but I understand there's an integrated care board meeting at the same time, which is going to make it problematic for Jonathan, David and Paul to actually to attend. But we've had a discussion with them before the meeting started about still going ahead with that date, if it's all possible, and they would send deputies to talk to talk through in terms of where they currently actually are with the process rather than delay, delay because it would, I think certainly from the solid old people, it could potentially start moving into your period, period which, we, which we'd which we want to, to avoid if at all possible. So is the committee happy with that? But next time in March, the, the organisation sent through deputies rather than the three speakers we have today. Are we happy with that? Okay, thank, thank you for that. And thank you for the presentation. And thank you for the questions, members. The next item we've got is the West Midlands Ambulance Service University NHS Foundation Trust Review. And we've got David Melbourne again and Mark Dusty, who's the Director of Nursing and Clinical Commissioning. And Viet Cashew, hope I've got pronunciation correct. Yeah, old words. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it really, who's the Strategy and Engagement Director for the West Midlands Ambulance Service. Uh, this here is to consider the West Midlands Ambulance Services activity and conveyance to hospitals. The last hour was due to hand over delays, response time categories, and profile of serious incidents. Uh, so, can I pass over to yourself to give that report? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, the local Birmingham residents, the first time I've been in the building, and I actually got lost walking around outside. So um, before I get into some of the detail that you've got before, perhaps I'll spend a minute just talking about the organisation to give everybody a bit of a feel. So we were constituted in 2006. Uh, we covered the West Midlands conurbation, so right up to sort of Staffordshire, Herefordshire, Shropshire, on towards Coventry. We also provide PTS, patient transport, up in the northwest, so we're all Warrington, that area as well. Employed just short of 8,000 staff across uh, the region. Um, Birmingham, actually, for us, is one of our biggest sort of hubs, so to speak. So we've got nearly 1,000 staff um, split across Erdington and Hollywood. The two of our major hubs that we've got in Birmingham, as I say, in Erdington and Hollywood. And they cover Birmingham and Solihull. Um, as an area budget around about 400 million pounds um, have been year after year after year the most uh, the highest performing ambulance service in the country by far that's not the case now though and we'll get into that we'll get into that detail in a minute um, we're just trying to work out I wasn't being rude but I was just trying to work out the kind of length of service we've all got on on our road and I, I reckon it's probably 150 100. to 180 years between us um, and we've touched on it a little bit but what we're dealing with now I mean I hope I can speak for colleagues none of us have seen in our situation that is out there when it comes to urgent and emergency care is not something Saying, saying. So I'm going to talk through, you've got two information packs before you, because we're a regional ambulance service, but we're here before Birmingham Solihull Joint Committee. So what I've done is to create two sort of packs of information, one which is just data specifically around the Birmingham Solihull patch, which is there for information, but another deck which I'll run through, which is about us as an organisation, and there is also information specifically about Birmingham and Solihull. So just forgive me, because there's going to be a bit about us as a trust and also a bit about Birmingham Solihull specifically as an area that we serve. Because we serve, we're, we're talking about an ICS area, we serve six, Birmingham Solihull being one of them. Um, we're actually hosted in the Black Country um, uh, as an NHS provider, we're hosted uh, over there. So, um, the, the, just turning to the information, I'll just I'll run through it, and then hopefully we'll have time sufficient time for questions. So, what's happened over the last three years? Because actually, it, it wasn't that long ago we wouldn't be here answering questions about this. Because actually, by and large, our patients across Birmingham, Solihull, and West Midlands didn't have an issue when it came to nine 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 and their emergency services. Because our response times were, were, as I say, class leading across the country, and specifically in Birmingham, Solihull area too so we'll talk about what's gone on over the course of recent history talk about our activity that's important where are patients going what's been the trend with phone you know 99 calls and transport to hospital we'll talk about also what's gone on with what we call handover delay so lost hours and you'll see a relationship i'm sure between that and our response times um, by category of call um, we'll also pick up on serious incidents because that's prompted one of the reasons why we're here. We'll talk about the serious incidents and the profile, what the, what, what the numbers, the profile, what, what their makeup. There's two slides where we've listed out all the actions we've taken. I'm not going to go through those because it's two long slides. I'm just going to pick up on one where there's the sorts of things that actually have made a real difference. And between us all, they've made a real difference. We'll talk about some of the outcomes, and I've got a few concluding remarks. So uh, third slide. There's lots of bar charts here, but basically what it's telling us all here is that the numbers of patients ringing 999 have continued to increase, as they have been year on year. That's not an issue. The numbers of patients we've taken to hospital over the last couple of years have started to decrease. The numbers of patients going to hospitals across the West Midlands are broadly where they were in 2017-18, despite having more calls coming through the service. It's a mixture of things, but actually one of the, one of the things that is a key reason behind that is all the alternative pathways that we've got for patients now and infrastructure we've put behind managing patients needs um slide four the next one um this is quite this is quite a significant slide for us so 
clearly we take patients to hospitals. We've all seen the news, what, what's happening out there, not just in the West Midlands and beyond. But that's what's going on in terms of our resources. So at peak, we've put out 380 to 400 ambulances across the region. Birmingham would have 25% of that. Black Country would have another 25 So half of our resources are actually split across Birmingham, Solihull and the Black Country. And that's because that's where the population density ultimately is. Out of 380 to 400 ambulances, not necessarily this week, but in times gone by, could have 120 to 130 of them stuck. And there's nobody who can trade and do their job with a third or a quarter of their capacity not available to them. It's just not possible. And though, though what you're seeing there are, are lost hours. It's in hours. I guess 45, it's peak, that's December. Peak 45 lost, 45,000, sorry, lost hours. I'd hazard a guess it's probably 130 ambulance shifts in a day. Um, you know, that's the, that's the sort of scale that we're talking about. But you can see in prior years, it was... It started to increase year and year, been increasing actually for several years, but the last two years have been a real tipping point for us in, in, in our in our region. The next slide just highlights how um, that's lost out the the blue bars are the lost hours going across. The green line over the top are the transport centre hospitals. So we're taking fewer patients in, but you can see what we've experienced with with lost hours. Next slide. Now, what I'm trying to do here is just cover what's happened with response time. So clearly we're really interested in response times. Category one represents, you know, immediate threat to life. That's somebody who's unconscious, cardiac arrest. It's the, it's, it's, it's the most urgent of calls we get. And you can see up until around about June 21, that wasn't an issue to us as an organisation, but it is now. We get perhaps around about 150 of those calls a, a day. It's actually a minority of what we do, thankfully, because clearly we don't want people in that sort of situation. We go to the next slide. So category two gets a lot of attention because that's around the chest pain, the query stroke, the severe shortness of breath. It's that sort of call. Again, um, you could see up until June 21, we didn't. We were, I think one of the only ambulance trusts to actually deliver the CAPT response time standard. So that's an average of 18 minutes. That's the target. You can clearly see how, how far it's blown out. Next slide is CAT3. Now, CAT3 doesn't get enough attention as a description, but actually you'll know about the people because it's typically an older person who's fallen, who's on the floor at home, somebody may have broken a hip. It's that sort of stuff. It's urgent. Before, we used to take around about an hour to get to those sorts of patients. But, you know, you can see there the, the duration of time. That really, really hurts us because we know what that means to, to patients. We absolutely know what that means, and it's not acceptable. So, serious incidents. If we go to the next slide, um, essentially, with the rise in response times for patients, we've had an exponential rise in the serious incidents. And why wouldn't we, if we're not meeting patients' needs and not getting there in time? If somebody's felt the need to ring 999 and we're taking hours and not minutes. Of course, it stands to reason there's going to be a significant level of harm to patients. And you can see as, as our response times have deteriorated, you can see what the impact has been year on year. So the, the sort of tunnel of colour that is, sort of yellowy orange, that's the current, the current year, current sort of financial year that we're in. Go to the next slide. Now, this is Birmingham Solihull specific information. Um, you can see three quarters of those serious incidents are linked to more than three quarters, sorry, linked to delayed response. Um, there are other incidents though. So you can see, for example, it's not all delayed response times, but for example, call management. So that's our taking of calls and incidents linked to that. But actually, it, but there's a link. So for example, now 25% of all of our trouble nine calls aren't, I need an ambulance. They are, where is my ambulance? And you can imagine when we were meeting our response time standards, that was more like 5%. Now it's a quarter of our call. That's about 1,500 calls a day now. Uh, you could, we could all, perhaps it could have been one of us. It has been, I've had to call 999 last year at a, at, a, at a car accident I went to. You can imagine being that person who's seen somebody deteriorating to the point of extremis. You can imagine the emotion and the anger. Well, I'm all assessing at the other end of that too. 
imagine that impact that has because actually it's not within their gift to create the response that those people need but they get on the receiving end of the frustration understandably around it that's starting to affect how we take calls sometimes actually because you can imagine they're human beings and they're dealing with a lot of emotion a lot of anger what does it mean though so there's a little table there patient seen a shift well for us they've halved so a typical ambulance shift is 12 hours we used to do around six to seven jobs on a 12 hour ambulance shift in some parts of our region that's below three and actually for december it's probably down to two and if your first patient is somebody who's going to a hospital in the region on a bad day that could be the only job you do and that's starting to affect you can imagine as clinicians you need a throughput you need case mix you need you need hands-on contact with patients to keep skills up well, that's getting difficult now um next two slides i'll skip past actually for me because there's just list of the actions we've taken i just want to talk about the ones that have really made a difference actually um they're there for your information and i'll obviously take questions one of the things that's attracted attention across the country is actual call answering because it's not just about response times it's how quickly do you do we pick up a call when somebody rings 999 because you may have heard stories of people waiting for minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes that's a hell of a long time when you want 999 for us right now as we're in this meeting it's two seconds some patients have waited minutes we record how many patients wait over two minutes for a call by far we're the best in the country at that so the rest of the country might have 70 or 80 thousand patients waiting more than two minutes to have a 999 call answered we might have a hundred of those 70 or 80 thousand um because that's the first safety net you don't we don't know who's out there to actually pick up the phone and and, and take the call clearly clinical validation team so um when i talk about sort of june 21 in july 20 when we could see what was going on we ourselves had to do something you know with what's in our gift to actually make the difference so we set up something called the clinical validation team so we've got a group of senior paramedics there's about 70 of them in total 24 7 who for lower categories of calls instead of just us dispatching ambulances those patients get a call back from a paramedic to just talk to them about the need for the ambulance what's going on that's that's had a dramatic impact for us and it, again it comes back to why we're managing to reduce some pay, the numbers going into hospitals so we have this thing called hear and treat so when you call 999 are we able to manage your need at the point of a call rather than having to send an ambulance out we can see it's gone from three and a half percent of our calls to 20. so managing to actually find alternatives for the patients that are coming through and i'll come back to why that's really important as well We've been sending um active we've been trying to balance the activity out because actually uhb hospitals have been under extreme pressure some others have been under less so we've been activity away from uhb to just try and balance things out i have to say actually for the last perhaps few weeks now and a bit longer that the need to do that has reduced because actually the system has been in a better place so patients have been able to go to their local hospitals without us having to go elsewhere to just try and load Low level. Introduce the means to electronically refer patients actually. So when we've got a patient who's got an urgent need but not an emergency, I electronically refer those patients out to other services. So for example, within Birmingham, we've got something called urgent community response um, provided by Birmingham Community Health. Um, we're now pushing over, we'll be referring 100 patients a day. We have done this week. We've been starting to really peak at those sorts of numbers. They're taking 30, 40, 50, 60 patients a day off our hands. Those would have been patients otherwise that would have had to have had an ambulance actually having their needs met by Birmingham community. And we're very grateful. We're very grateful for that. Because actually in the context, if that wasn't there, sort of having our colleagues and community responding in a couple of hours, those patients would be waiting 12 hours or 12 hours, you know, or 15 or even or even longer. Um, the ICB, and this has been a joint scheme between us all actually, um, funded a significant investment our organization to provide what we've called it what we term an ambulance decision area so we staff across the uhb hospitals group um the receival area so it's our staff who are jointly working with uhb colleagues to to actually convey to our staff so our staff are now turning up with a patient and it's our staff who, who are embedded in uhb who are taking the hand over off those colleagues to enable those colleagues to go it's helped with staffing in emergency department. It's given our staff a new role to actually develop into 
So they're doing the first initial assessments and, and investigations for those patients. Um, and it stopped us having to have a random group of staff having to stay with patients at the hospital. We've now got a static group of staff who are looking after those patients. Is it in the in the in the other pack you see actually three months of improvement before December where we've gone off again. And that that ambulance decision area is a big big part of that. And it's a significant undertaking. So we're talking about over 70 staff from our organization across the three sites. I'd also like to say it's not quite necessarily the focus of the meeting, but it's provided significant employment opportunity because we've employed 36 um, ambulance care assistants who've come from all parts of um, industries and sectors to want to have a career in health and they're new to the NHS and that's that's a good thing. We're, we're ple really pleased about that. But then the ICB again is invested in other roles. So for example, we've got a role of hospital ambulance liaison officers. So they're people managing the interface between our crews turning up in the emergency department and the hospitals, like an interface role. Of, we've got that presence across the hospitals 24 seven. <laughs> and we've also, because we managed to recruit these ambulance care assistants, we've been funded to recruit even more of those as well. Go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a really busy slide, but I guess I'll just get to the punchline of it, which is in Birmingham, Solical for December, it had the lowest conveyance rates in the region. So if, so if you look at how many non now nine calls have we got, how many people ended up in hospital, it was 42.2%. Well, actually, the thing is, the thing about the ambulance services, it's all the patients that people don't get to see that we manage in through other ways. It's not actually all about what ends up in hospital. There's a huge amount of work going on to manage people in their home and to get the support they require. Go to the next slide again. And that, that's, that comes back to the point I made at the beginning about fewer and fewer people going to hospital despite more demand. Um, next slide, uh, again, specifically in Birmingham, Solio, you can see we've got a sustained reduction of patients going into hospitals. That means ambulances don't get stuck because they never went there in the first place. That means they're available for the next patient. So I guess in all of this, the ask of our partners is do your level best to punish people at that place of home or wherever they may be and that between us all do our best to not convey and between us all we're managing to make some real inroads into all of that but my concluding remark so you know, we had i started by saying we had a track record of meeting or exceeding all of our response time standards year after year after year but that has not been the case now for nearly two years why well clearly it's a complex problem. You guys will be familiar with it, but we started this problem been brewing for years because actually four hour waiting times, trolley waits, all these sorts of things have been rising for years. And that effect, that's affected us, but we got tipped over that. We couldn't come there's a point where we just couldn't compensate for it anymore. I think if we go if we cast our minds back to that time, that's when the NHS reo had to reopen, it, it, it's patients re-engaging, it's clinics running, it's operating lists, it's, it's resumption of services and a lot of latent demand that was not being met. To help service. Also, whilst managing really complex issues of ongoing infection prevention control outbreak, COVID never went away. You know, our productivity, not just with us, but through hospitals has been severely impacted by having to manage peaks and troughs of so patients still with COVID, now with flu, those who haven't got it, you know, it creates horrible inefficiencies in a in a in a patient pathway. Our serious incidents have effectively tracked our inability to res to respond to patients, and I hope I've made clear the relationship as to why we didn't suddenly become incapable, we didn't suddenly just give up and say we're just not going to bother responding to patients because we did it for years. We're not able to do it now. Um, I'd like to also say we've had a lot of support, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, we're not sat here to throw any shade at any part of our system because actually we've had actually what it amounts to millions of pounds of investment to try and make the difference. And they're not just in with us, but other partners and like community and others too to try and make the difference. But in terms of us specifically as an organization, the scale of this problem is far, far bigger than our ability in isolation to address it. Because if we could do, we absolutely would do. And I'll stop there take any questions or comments that colleagues may have. Yeah, thank you. Question about uh, response and 
personal experience from over years back that uh, does that still happen and there's still those fast response paramedics that come out no, no, no. in advance of an ambulance? The model we might make, if I, if I, um, if I mischaracterise the model of care, Mark will correct me, but we've moved away from solo responding staff um, to a different, a, a very different kind of model. So um, each of our ambulances have a paramedic on board. That's not the case in any other ambulance service. So if we were to go to a neighbouring one, maybe only 30% of the ambulances actually have paramedics. They have other grades of staff. So there's, a t there's kind of a dichotomy. We get paramedics doing it like a solo response. But what happens when, they, when that patient needs to go to hospital? They're not going to get you there on the back of a motorbike or in a car, are they? So an ambulance has to then come. What the country seat finds is that when you that person may get there quickly, but then they're stuck there for hours. You've got, two, you've got the ambulance then turning up. So what when we've looked at that, and the reason why we changed our model of care is actually it's a less efficient model. Because when you look at what something we look at, which is resources per incident, that model of care requires more resources per incident, inherently less efficient. So we wanted to get an ambulance to a patient because it either can make a decision to leave you at home, or if you need it to be transported, it's there to transport you. And as I say, prior to two years back, nearly, we didn't have an issue of responding with an ambulance. We didn't have to send a fast responder. So, so a good example of what Vivek is describing is if you've had a stroke. So what you need if you've had a stroke is you need to get to a hyperacute stroke unit quickly. So a motorbike doesn't help in that respect. Um, what we are now looking at, though, is that period of time between calling and getting an ambulance because as Vivek said we've never had a problem getting there quick up until the last probably year and a half two years so if you're in cardiac arrest getting an ambulance 15 minutes later probably isn't worth it you know because you, you're almost certainly going to be dead unless someone is with you to help you and so one of the things that we're actually advertising at the moment to expand our first responder scheme so that it's the first responders. So in cardiac arrest, that's a good example where even an ambulance getting to you in seven minutes is too slow. You need someone there, usually with the defibrillator. So if you're in a shock or rhythm, they can help you quickly. And then the ambulance gets there to stabilise and take you onward to, um, you know, usually a specialist centre. So um, we've got to look at the model we've got because um, we're not going to get back to where we used to be, is my view. Um, you know, Vivek's been in the service or in the health service 21 years. Um, I've been in nearly 40 years. Uh, so some of this stuff I have seen before. I've seen long waiting times in hospitals, a lot longer than they are now. They only go up before they go down. From my experience, um, promises you get given up the money on it, but they will not go down before they go up. Because that's the nature of what happens. But I don't work in a hospital, so my job is to talk about the ambulance service, but none of this stuff that Vivek's spoken about is due to COVID. Okay? But don't believe anyone that says we've had a bad year because of COVID and that's what's caused this. I was writing about this stuff seven and eight years ago and I didn't know about COVID, did I? Because I couldn't have done. So it was going to happen. It happens to have happened quicker because of COVID. But the delays at hospital were always going to reach a peak in the way that they have. It might have been next year or the year after. But the way the graphs were going, it was always going to happen. So in a sense, it's wrong for people to sit here and say we've had a bad year because of flu and COVID. We always have flu. COVID was on the risk register. A novel respiratory virus has always been a threat to the NHS. We got through it, but what we've got to do is we've now got to sort of recalibrate where we're all at to be able to provide the right service that people need. Yeah, to, to, to further question, um, you showed some of your you know, conveying to because people are self-conveying now. <laughs> so um, two, 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 th maybe three points around that. So there's genuinely us having a much bigger range of alternative pathways. So 
two years ago, did we have urgent community response? No. And we're putting, you know, 30, 40, 50 patients a day through that now. Patients are undoubtedly, I mean, it comes back to the confidence issue as well that uh, David talked about. There we undoubtedly patients who would think, who would think, you know what, given the state, but given what I hear, I can't, I'm not going to read no, 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 I'm just going to make my own way to hospital. That, that is undoubtedly happening. And also during December, you can see how bad December's been. And the, during the, what we've had to do in response to this, because actually in terms of some of our serious incidents, which included death, those families told us, and Mark meets with those families, if you told us how long the ambulance was going to be, we would have made our own way, and it may have made the difference. So at times of real delay, we have to say to patients, look, you need an ambulance, but if you can make your own way to hospital, do it. And that could amount to hundreds of patients a day. Actually, for the last week or so, it's been less than 50, because actually our response times, like right now, eight out of nine of the response metrics that we're responsible for are being delivered right now as we speak. But go back to December, we, there's a day where we had to tell 700 people to make their own way to hospital because we weren't going to get there. So, so what we need to be careful of, I think, is that we don't create the ambulance service as a non-responsive service. So we're a blue light emergency service that still has a strong brand. We want to maintain that. So I, I liken it to a bit like we've got a, a haystack with a couple of needles. A couple of the needles are the really big people that need them. The haystack is the bit that keeps getting bigger and bigger. Because on the one hand, you could say long conveyance of nearly 60% is brilliant, isn't it? But actually, if we really were an emergency ambulance service, we would be conveying most people. So when we've got alternatives, we can route people to. That, I think, is a failure of the system in itself. So I'll give an example. We get a lot of this where people call us because their urinary catheter's blocked. Well, don't call us. You know, I've, I've put in urinary catheters. People should be told what to do to manage their catheter, to know what to do if it blocks. By the time we get to you, you'll be like a balloon because we, we're not going to prioritise. It's not life-threatening. You shouldn't be approaching a 999 service and it will be a total failure if we just act as a signposting service into alternatives, because first of all, it duplicates and it's hugely expensive. We're a very, very expensive service. Um, an ambulance costs about £170 per hour to run. Um, admittedly, some of this work we can get rid of at source and divert it into a community service. But my question is, why, the, why is the patient not going there in the first place? I think we need to avoid setting up lots of alternatives that we route into and getting patients directly into them if they need. You know, I don't, patients are not stupid, are they? They're, they're very good at using services. It's just us that have created systems that are just confused. So that's the bit I think we need to work on. And at the moment, when measuring success in the wrong way, so if you look at the national stuff, it's all whoever's got the highest non-conveyance is doing really well. And I think we've just got to turn that onto its head and actually say, let's get back to the situation where someone that needs an emergency ambulance gets it very, very quickly. So some of the graphs that Vivek put up hide a lot of stuff. So if I was to say to you, during December, some patients that were in the category three waited three days, three days for an emergency ambulance. You get to Australia quicker. You know, it is an appalling service when the response times are that bad. Category two, come up with nearly 24 hours, wasn't it, I think, from memory. We're reporting at our board next week. If anyone's interested, you can get our board papers on, you know, in the public arena. In my report to the board, I've started to report the 20 longest waiters in each category for the month. And December's truly, truly dreadful. And for that, I apologise. I'm really sorry. Thank you. I've got a more. Uh, thank you, Chair. My, my question has sort of been answered because um, I was going to ask what, what does that mean do to triage what comes through? Because, yes, there are a lot of people who are needing medical emergency and they should be prioritised, but sadly there are a lot of people who do not. And even it's because they have the ability to make their own way through the hospital, as you touched on, you do recommend that sometimes. We also, there's a lot of people who Whatever one, whatever reason, clog up the service, and that's not just unique to the ambulance service. I know that's a problem at A and E. I know it's a problem at police staff as well. 
And what's been done to try and filter that out so that resource is not being wasted on those who do not need it. And it's being prioritised, particularly given the severe pressures that the emperor services on the moment. Because I know of certain cases uh, where sadly this does happen, you have people who basically pre COVID and bring through an ambulance every day, and I assume not getting other moments. But there's a lot of wastage that's going on, particularly with those kind of individuals. We need to find a solution so that those resources are free up to focus on other aspects. So, yeah, so um, I guess the, 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 the straightforward answer to that. Uh, Council more with that clinical validation team that I talked about. So there's essentially four categories of calls. Category one calls get immediately dispatched to. There's no discussion. Uh, pretty much most of category two does as well. That's the chest pain, the you know the query straight. Category three and four, we do not dispatch ambulances to until a, a, there's been a clinician conversation with the patient and where we can talk to them about what their needs are. Two years ago, that didn't happen. They'd get an ambulance as well. Then our staff on the ground would try and work it out with the patient. But we're managing to head that off before we dispatch. And as I say, that's enabled us to treat a significant chunk of people without actually having to send ambulances out. That was the big contribution we could make to this problem in terms of just trying to sift the queue that bit more aggressively and, and also to try and meet patients' interests in the right, right way. I mean, there's very few patients actually call us inappropriately. Um, Usually when you talk to them, they've tried everything. You know, I've, I've known a patients go into walk-in centres to be told they're not allowed to walk in. Um, they've got to go through the GP. Well, they've tried the GP. They've tried 111. You know, it, it, it's a really, really difficult sort of thing to navigate around if you're not. Even I have problems. Um, you know, an example I had when my father-in-law was dying, he needed some pain relief. The only way was to ring 111. I was here. He was in the northwest. The same number. You can't get through because you get through to the, you know. So there's little things like that that they're frustrations. Even if you know how to navigate a system, you know, there's um, people tell us it's difficult to get in to see GPs, for example. I don't know how hard they've tried, but if they tell us that, that's a common story that people are telling us. So. We're an easy service to access, but actually some of the waiting times have become so long that we're now putting people at risk of dying because we're getting to the wrong people sometimes or everybody's waiting just too long. You know, and we've got some horror, horrible stories that um, people that are very young, for example, dying of cardiac arrest when they shouldn't. So, you know, when Vivek, Vivek talked about the serious incidents, they've more than quadrupled and they're still going up. Um, which is very, very distressing for us in the service, because it's not why any of us have come into the service to. Is there an element of people wanting to speak to, say, a paramedic or something like that, to give them the reassurance? Because I know some of the GP that's up there. Yeah. It's not actually, they've been signposted to someone else in the GP practice, and it's the GP they want to speak to, not the nurse or something yeah. like that, because they would be the, they want to speak to the GP, because in their view, they're the most qualified person until the GP says that. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you do that sometimes the problem I've encountered that they have actually, when they've tried to get through it, they've been signposted to someone else, the free of GPs to focus on those who need a GP, um, rather than through services that can be dealt with through, through a nurse, for I example. Mean, you, you get that. So when you had the, re, the recent streptococcus um, infections, you know, people want that reassurance, you know, a sick child, when there's that going around, or a sick anybody, but particularly with the children, people were wanting reassurance. So our cause of things like that did go up. Um, that in itself, I don't think causes a problem. I mean, I think the, the biggest thing from our point of view is that by definition, we're an accessible service. You know, if you call 999, more often than not, we'll answer the phone after it's been put through by BT before you even hear it ring. You know, two seconds is usually our performance for answering. So if you've just spent you know, an hour trying to get through to your GP surgery, but you call us and you get a call answered within two seconds, it reinforces that as an easy gate to get through. Um, and, and that sometimes, if you've had a good experience through that route, well, you go and tell everyone and then you use it again, you know, but what it means is the people that need it quick, we're, we're then a little bit, you know, the needle in the haystack sort of, the needles are not getting more frequent, the haystack's just getting bigger and bigger. I mean, I've got a bit of personal experience with that because my wife is a GP in the in in inner city Birmingham here with her dad. Um, 
who, who at the age of 76 is still working full time as a, as a GP. Um, so I, that happens. But actually, when she talks to me about the discharge summaries, because they get the GPs get a discharge summary off first when she reads it, she'll be sat there thinking, why did you do that? You didn't have to do that. And that's another thing. There's, 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 another, there's another debate for the HOSCA another day about primary care access and things. But actually, the problem is we've got the media portrays a particular point at a point in time what's going on. But actually, for example, in my wife's case, every child that um, a parent wants to make an appointment for is guaranteed a same day appointment. But actually, thankfully, most people don't actually have to go and see their GPs very often. But if you would see what and hear what you believe, you wouldn't think it was worth ever speaking to a GP. And that's an issue, isn't it? it? It comes back to that point about confidence in health services. We need to regain confidence, the people's confidence in the services that they've got. So it does happen. But I, I, I would personally, I mean, my own personal views, it's not. It's by far not our biggest problem. It does happen, but it's not our biggest issue. Yeah. Thank you. Counts was Sexton, Pocock, and McCarthy in that order. We're running out of time. If so I could ask you to brief in the questions and brief in the responses, please. We've touched briefly on self transport, um, and this is something I had some experience with as um, I was called 111 with a rapidly escalating infection and was told that I should have an ambulance. We don't know how long that's going to be. Can you get there? And fortunately, I was. Lucky that I had a friend who could take me. Um, but then I had another experience when I was sat with somebody in December who sadly he had a stroke and he'd been told that we'll send an ambulance out to you and he'd been waiting over four hours. Um, and when his wife called and said, should I bring him myself, the ambulance um the, 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 the um, call responder said, no, we don't advise that. Can I ask what your policy is about advising people whether to self-transport or not self-transport um, and how, yeah. So when we're able to get to people in a timely way, which like Vivek said up until a couple of years ago we were, then it's very clear for things like that, that we don't advise it um, because it's, it's, it's inherently unsafe. Um, but equally, we never used to advise people that had fallen to move or drink or take tablets. Now we have to reconsider what the advice is in the nature of where we're at. Um, so we do now advise, for example, frail elderly people that have fallen. We say don't stop drinking, don't stop eating. Actually get into a comfortable position. Getting off the floor is probably less unsafe than moving, if you see what I mean. Um, so there are things where we are reconsidering the advice. Um, the difficult thing for us is knowing how quick we're going to get there. So, for example, most of those things, um, the, the example you give, fall into our biggest category of calls, which is category two. Um, now, you might be lucky in that an ambulance is driving past and it's not, a, it, it's not on another call and it will call straight away. So the distribution curve is quite um, varied. It can be sort of quick within a few minutes. Or it could be five hours. Now, the problem is we don't know that at the time. And we can send an ambulance to you and it can get to your front door. But until it's actually with you, it could be diverted onto a category one call. So it might be almost there, but then it goes. And then the next ambulance doesn't get to you. For hugely, hugely difficult. Whereas, so a couple of years ago, we could predict down to the minute when you would get it. So... It's one of the reasons why we need to rework out what it exactly is an ambulance service is there for. Is it for everything, the catch-all for everything when nothing else works, which is what we're currently doing? Or is it specific to emergency and urgent care? Um, now, the risk at the moment for us is, so if you take the frail elderly fall, the example I gave, some of those people, had we got there within an hour, we'd have picked them up, put them on the chair, they'd have had their dinner, they would never have gone anywhere near healthcare. Now, when they're on the floor for 15 hours, they're now dehydrated, confused with renal failure and muscle wastage, and they will definitely need admitting. So we're creating our own workload going forward. And we've got to, we've got to get away from that. So um, we're rethinking through, you know, you may have fallen and fractured your neck of femur, but that doesn't mean you have to lie on a hard floor on a cold environment you're going to be less harmed if you get back to bed or if someone helps you so um it's a difficult question to give a categoric answer to what i would hate 
and I'm actually leaving at the end of March, I can say this with conviction, I'm absolutely convinced the ambulance service is um, rehabilitatable, so to speak. We can get it back on its feet, but we've got to focus on, I, I'd hate the scenario where a stroke patient is trying to get to hospital when we are on the phone at someone's home trying to arrange a district nurse. Um, I think this is a particularly difficult case with strokes because when I've spoken to healthcare professionals, they've told me if somebody's had a stroke, you need to get into hospital as soon as possible by whatever means. Um, and You've got to be careful of the messaging though. So we had a road traffic collision recently where I think you were telling me when yeah, the patient yeah, was on their way to... So we've had, um, just by, by chance, I was with one of our staff members, one of our managers uh, earlier in the week, and he... Um, so we we so talking about solar response, we send a, a more senior manager uh, to respond to traffic collisions to support the seed. In two cases, the individuals had a hospital address in their sat nav. They were trying to get their own way to hospital and lost control of their vehicles because one was having a diabetic hypo. It's not a good thing to do to drive a car. The other person had a broken arm. He was trying to drive his car, the broken lost control. So they were trying to make their own way to hospital and obviously it, it wasn't good. Um, and that's why the messaging is really important because... I'm aware that there are certain drugs that can only give, be given with a, within a certain limited period of time after yeah. having a stroke. Yeah. And um, so presumably some of these patients may now be breaching that so, time. So yeah. I'll, I'll give yeah. you a couple of examples there that are real examples. So um, I've got a member of staff that works in my team that had a stroke a few years back. He got him in for thrombectomy. And he's back to work. He's not. He's not completely back to the hundred percent, which is probably ninety-five percent. He's leading on sort of medicine management. For me. I say this. I know he wants this story to be out there. We had a patient. Um, it wasn't in Birmingham and Solihull, but it was over at Telford Hospital. So the gentleman walked in, became unwell. He clearly had a stroke. Was scanned. Um, he was in the very early stages of a stroke, so they arranged for him to have a thrombectomy up in Stoke. It took four hours to get there. He was outside of any treatment window. So sadly, he died. Sadly, he died. Whereas had that not happened, he was 52. He'd have been back at work, paying his taxes with his family. Now, sadly, that's not an uncommon occurrence. You know, it's not. I'm not picking that patient story out and I've, I've heard that many times in the year not once in the last 10 years the the thing with the window of treatment as well and this is what frustrates me more than anything it's not an open and closed window so if you've had a stroke every minute we're delayed getting to you will result in you being harmed mm -hmm. by four hours it's almost not worth doing anything but it's no good saying well we've got an hour to get to you we haven't we, we've got to get there straight away because any delay, any delay is going to harm you. And that's why we find the whole issue of handover delays so frustrating and indeed unacceptable, because people just don't get it. They don't get the bit, because often people will come back at me and say, look, we're all right with that. The patient's safe in the back of the ambulance. Yeah, they are. They're lucky. They've got the ambulance. It's the people out there that are waiting for the ambulance that isn't coming. So... More often than not, in the last year, we've had no ambulances to send to anybody. The next ambulance available is the one that becomes available when the patient's taken off it at the hospital. I think perhaps this would work particularly in what the advice is being given, based on what's well, safest under the current circumstances. Except that's not the answer. Mm -hmm. The answer is get those ambulances unloaded, because like Vivek showed, we ain't taking loads of people in. So it can't be that, can it? Sure. Um, the other thing is, just to focus people's minds, the, 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 the figure that, that, that Vivek put up there for December, those lost hours have cost eight and a half million pounds. And it's not just the financial cost. That eight and a half million is a lot of money just to lose. They're vehicles that are fully staffed. So we're not saying we're short of staff. We're not saying we're short of resource. What we're saying is we just need that resource to get out there and be productive. So financial loss, but the opportunity lost your... I mean, in terms of the advice, I'm not suggesting that's an alternative. I'm just saying in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. but I'm aware that we're short of time. Um, can, can just 
we really are short. So if we come back to you possibly later on, we okay. need to get Councillor Parker and Councillor McCarthy. And obviously we have another item to get attended to within today's meeting. Thank you. Councillor Parker. It's actually a brief one. I'm sorry to hear that I'm leaving this month. Um, I've always appreciated that you've got to be given in a very honest and accessible way. Um, it's a shame we've diminished the amount of um, bereavement. <laughs> I'll put another 20 years in, I'll get there. Um, well, candidate enough to say several years ago you could see the problems coming. I just wonder who wasn't listening at that time, and do you feel they are now listening, and that there is a way forward that um, responds to the uh, analysis that you had in the past. Yeah, so I'll try and be diplomatic and honest. Um, so some of you may have seen, I got some media publicity back in May through no touting for that. I happened just to answer a question to a health service journalist and um, I've been plotting this for many, many years. Um, and uh, I, I analysis, the tipping point was always when we lost 30% of our hours to hand over delays and, and for, for information that's when we get to 60,000 and, and for December we were at 45. So we're not away from that, we might not have reached that in the summer but the graph is still going up. January was still going up until last week when it started but we're getting close to that point where people will ring and we won't be able to say well we're going to get to you within any time it will be you know um, I think there's a number of people that weren't listening. I, I, I think all of the regulators weren't listening. Um, or if they were, they didn't do anything. Um, I, I've got letters that I can very much share with you that all have names on of people that weren't listening, in my view, that are still there. Um, now, wh whether it's that they didn't believe me or whether my message wasn't strong enough. So just to give you an example, um, I was saying that you know we've lost 68 hours in a, in a day and this is just going to get severe and it's going to cause patient harm. That was 68 hours in a day. We're losing two and a half thousand hours in a day sometimes now. You know, and that, that's a lot of resource just to, I don't know what the metaphor is that I can use here, but you, you know what I mean? There's a metaphor that it's not like we're short of staff where we can say, we well, can give us as much money we can't deliver. This isn't per se a money issue. This is saying we've got the resource. We just want to be out there helping people. That's what we've all come into this service to do. We don't want to be, you know, as Vivek says, I'm spending every day going around meeting families and apologising for their relative or loved one dying when they shouldn't have done. It's hard for us because that's not why we've come into the service and it's entirely preventable in my view. Um, but yeah, if you want to know the names, I'll share some letters. I've got two Lever Arch files full of them. So come back as a service improvement consultant <laughs> yeah. an expert. Yeah, and I wouldn't go to America for three weeks if it were me. Thank you. Right, I'll be brief. Uh, why don't we use technology like uh, the video and the camera so you can see the patient? Because sometimes you're stuck with just an explanation with people not very good at explaining themselves. Um, so we, I don't know if you know, all our ambulances are paper free. So we, we don't use paper in the service. I mean, there'll be little bits like Vivex notebook and that, but PDAs, yeah. We're digitally enabled, so it means we use an electronic record platform that's um, that's got digital cameras front and back. We need to be careful because in our world, you can't just send sort of quite sensitive information over. Well, WhatsApp probably is the one that you can, but some of these platforms are not secure enough just to, for the patient to send pictures to us. We've got the ability to do it um, and probably arguably, you know, your, your challenge is probably a fair one because for some things, um, I'm thinking of an example. One thing that's very helpful is if we get a scene of a road crash. So if we get what we call the mechanism of injury, we have a much better ability to plan what we need to do when we get there. So things like that are really, really helpful. Um, if somebody's on an ECG machine, for example, just a simple sort of video or picture of the tracing sent electronically to us can help us. But we actually use the technology ourselves. So, for example, when we're on scene with a patient, those records are viewable by the hospital. So we use the digital technology quite a lot. And I think, is it Opal? Yeah, yeah so we had, um, so we're just talking of the BSOL context, actually. We had a... Um, 
a trial. So between ourselves, UHP Hospitals and BT, where our staff were kitted out was a, was a backpack and it basically had one of those Google, um, I don't know what you'd call them. It's like those Google glasses, you put them on and it's got camera technology. Also had an electronic stethoscope um, and an ECG device that could transmit. So what we would do if we'd go to an older patient, the guys would put the kit on and they could have a direct conversation with consultants over at UHB who could then see the patient through the Google glasses. So they're able to then speak to the crew about examine this, have a look at that, do this, do that. Um, that was really, really high end kit. Uh, that was almost experimental as a package, yeah. but actually proved it's worth. And I think that's kind of the thing you're talking about. Yeah, no, my about question this. was a bit simpler. Why can't the uh, person that's called you on a mobile just go have a look at that? I mean, there's a number of issues. One, getting people to be able to do that quickly, which there's been no attempt to. Most people would be a little bit balked by that at the moment because we haven't tried to set it up either on the NHS app, which just says, and it's a non-savable picture, so there's no GPDS. It's just so the call handler can get his information quickly by seeing yeah, I, I know, I know is the saying. person on the floor. It can all be, oh, yes, okay. Well, now to go through a long still be the answer is a lot of these people have fairly straightforward things. You know, the, the frail elderly four being the example, it's probably more distressing for us just to see it because we know there's nothing more we can do because we haven't got any ability to do anything anyway, you know. Um, the, the other thing I would just add is that all the all the calls are clearly recorded at our end, aren't, aren't they? And the people taking the 999 call aren't clinicians. They're, really, they're following a really strict kind of protocol about categorization and dispatch or not if you send them an image they're not they're not trained or they're not empowered to do anything with that sort of and nor could we record it you know we've got to be able to record the interaction with the patient so we know that we've got a contemporaneous record with the so that's another issue that isn't probably helpful but there's a big opportunity to be had around telemedicine not necessarily patient to ambulance directly like that but actually us with patient with specialists and always bringing a specialist input into the home, so to speak, that's definitely a, an area. Getting the right person into the ambulance quickly. I mean, people would probably need to deal, dial you on uh, one of the apps that, and that's how they call an ambulance, because it's usual for audio until somebody goes, yeah, and then you, and that you can see, and that's all it is to it. No, no complication. Well, what it would do is it would tell us if you're a cat one or not. Yeah, that's so it. You can use your phone. Yeah. Conscious and breathing. So. In that sense, it will you out if you want to bring, you know, which some people say actually would be quite helpful. Because you'd be surprised at how many people say they're not. You just pilot it somewhere and see see what it tells you. Okay. Oh, by the way, uh, Councillor Slay has been trying to attach your attention. Oh. Just, one, okay. just one quick, okay. Earlier on, you alluded to um, inappropriate calls. To, to the ambulance service. Now, I don't know whether I've dreamt this, but a few years ago, wasn't there a big media campaign? Yeah, yeah. Is that not something that you've thought of doing again? And Do you know what happened after that? No, that's what I was going to ask. The calls went up. Sorry? The calls went up. Really? I can't remember right. what the exact... <laughs> put things on this side of the ambulance that said only call us for chest pain, breathing, or... I can't remember what. There were three things from memory, but... What happened is it didn't stop the people that didn't have those things, but anyone, so you got the 15 year old that had just finished playing tennis and so he'd ring 999 because we told them to ring 999 for chest pain when clearly it was muscular sports related chest pain, you know. So yeah, it, it, it actually surprisingly did the opposite to what we thought it would. Okay, so is there any work going on anywhere to think about how we can re-educate people? So, I think all the evidence that I've looked at suggests you can't educate the public with things like this. What, what you need to do is look at how they use services and try and design the services as to where people go. So I know there's a lot of debate, for example, is where do you put urgent treatment centres? Do you put them in Solihull or do you put them next to Heartlands? And well, generally, people would say, look at where the patients go. It's a bit like putting in footpaths, isn't it? If you put in a footpath that people don't want to walk, they'll only cut the corner across the grass, won't they? So because we put services in at certain places doesn't mean that's where people will go to use them. You know, we've got to make sure that if we put services in, that they're accessible and people will actually use them. So 
if you have to get on the bus and you haven't got any money, you want to be nothing to do that. Um, so I think we need to be careful where we put services. And then the other thing is, there was a great example. I mean, you'll know it up in Stoke, the uh, walk-in centre. Bleak or Haywood. Uh, Haywood. So they built this lovely big new walk-in centre. And it got filled, you know, 40-odd 40, 40 thousand people a year going into it. But it didn't stop anybody going to the A&E that Vivek used to run up, up there. So, so it, it sort of fulfilled the demand. Yeah, yeah. So there's no plans to re-educate. Re Anybody. And there's, um, there's sort of national communications around choosing wisely and choosing well. But I guess our lived experiences, it doesn't make a job to difference. We've got to build the services around where patients choose to access them and build a process. I'll give you a personal example. You know, I wanted to use my local chemist. I went there at three o'clock on a Saturday and it were closed. So I've tried to choose well and been unable to do so because, you know, it's not designed. I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought a chemist would close at three in the afternoon, but it did. You go to other countries, like when I go on holiday, the chemist shop seems to be the last thing that close at night, you know, and it just seems so much easier in other places. But, you know, I, I don't know, hopefully we can get all of this stuff sorted um, before, you know, before it's too late. Okay. No sec council section would like to come in. I'm going to say I'd like us to actually to move on at this at this stage. Can I thank you for the for the presentations. Can I thank the members for the questions. I understand that you're coming back to the joint OSC on the 13th of March. Sorry, can I just ask if you have an email address I can contact you yeah. with about this? Um, you know, what the best contact is. Got my email okay. Thank you. Okay, so, so th thank you for that. Then the last item we've got is the Birmingham Solial Integrated Care System update on performance on finance and recovery plans. We've got Paul Appy, so thank you for be being patient and, and waiting here. I understand you're going to sort of give us a brief, so a brief highlight of what the important points are, and then Mem's going to ask questions. Very briefly, if, if that's, that's what good with you, Chair. So, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, this is a follow up from um, the update that we gave at, at the last meeting. So a number of the uh, the graphs you'll have seen before, and they're just updated with with another month's worth of additional data. It, they do pick up a number of areas where councillors asked for further information at the last meeting. So that that's now reflected into the back. And um, if I'm going to summarise very quickly, I would say from a finance perspective, we have high confidence that we will deliver against all of our statutory duties as a as a system this year. And um, you'll see that our, we are still in deficit. It's a year-to-date position, but that deficit has been reducing month on month since since June, um, and we would be confident that that will continue and, and, and enable us to reach a break-even position. Um, from a performance perspective, whilst obviously that's all very nuanced and complex, um, the majority of, of the key performance indicators that we're measured uh, against as a health system, um, you will see there's been some quite significant improvement, most of which peaked uh, in sort of July, um, June, July, August period, and a number have been improving uh, since that point. I can go into any of those in detail if councillors want to, to question um, those. Um, that's not to say that we are anywhere near where we need to be at this point. Um, obviously, very clearly, there are still a number of challenges in the health service in general and in Birmingham and Solihull specifically, uh, and, and there's a significant amount of additional improvement that is still required to get to where, where we expect to be as a system and where uh, where we need to be for our patients and citizens. But happy to take more specific questions based on where councillors wish us to, to go into. Thank you. Um, looking at the, the data that's presented, um, I think you remember seeing a metric somewhere. I think it might have been in the quality account um, about the proportion of patients receiving what they regard as adequate pain relief. Um, now, I don't think I'm that in the most recent I'm wondering if that's data that you collect. Um, um, it, would be, it, it would be likely to be data that individual providers would collect, and certainly the sort of thing that would usually be included in quality accounts. Um, one of the things I'm wondering is um, actually the emergency weights increasing. I mean, obviously, the total time is a concern, and it's a concern for the system. But as far as the patient's concerned, actually, the delay to getting adequate pain relief is also a very relevant factor. So I'm wondering if there's anything that can be collected or um, made available on that particular 
Said go away and, and and discuss with our providers what information is available. I know that lots of people would be happy to wait a little bit longer if they receive the pain relief yeah. sooner. Yes, um, and obviously, I mean, our, our, our providers do everything that they can to keep patients comfortable in those situations. Um, but but yes, we can look into that. One of the things I'm a little bit concerned about is that in the hurry to bring down those waiting times, which obviously is a national target, sometimes some of the other things can maybe um, be made a lower priority and I'm worried that, that this might be one of those and that's based on the experience of myself and people I've spoken to so it would be interesting to know if that data could be collected. Yeah, I have to look into that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, Councillor McCarthy? So looking at uh, the page and discharges, uh, what are we doing about the right to reside? reside? We've got 200 beds and listening to the ambulance presentation, I think one of the things that's critical is the flow through the system, because if it flows through the system slow, you're always going to get a backup at the entrance part of it. Yes, so um, absolutely right. And and almost certainly the, the biggest single driver for some of our ambulance challenges has been that flow through through our hospitals. Um, it, it probably, I would start by saying that in terms of right to reside, um, we actually, uh, as a system, are probably one of the more high performing systems uh, in the region and in the country. And certainly the support that we've had from social care colleagues and the work that we've been doing collectively um, does mean that actually, unlike the vast majority of systems and unlike the message that's in, in the media, the reasons that are, that are delaying our discharges generally aren't access to social care support. Um, the challenges that we do have are particularly that bit around flow through the hospitals. So there's been some additional work going in to, uh, to link our community services more effectively uh, into our hospitals. Um, there is, uh, we're, we're now um, following um, a pull model where, a community, where whenever a community bed is available, the community trust will pull from the hospital as opposed to relying on patient on, on the hospital pushing that through. Um, there is, you'll you'll know that uh, from recent announcements, there's been additional funding that's been made available during this quarter um, for us to purchase additional uh, packages of care and additional beds to help some of that flow through. Uh, and we are now on daily reporting for the number of uh, beds or number of additional packages that we're purchasing through that additional funding. So we're expecting that to help further to push uh, push things down. Um, and if I'm honest. A lot of this is also about just good practice within the hospital setting. So it's making sure you're identifying your discharges early, that you're getting all of your processes set up uh, to enable that discharge to happen in a, in a timely way. And I think there's some more work uh, that we can still do uh, as a system that will help with that. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that we're focusing significant amounts of effort on. Do you have any analysis, uh, what you call a zoomy chart in a lot of cases, that shows all of the operation things that go on to get somebody through a particular process? And this process is getting someone from the, the start to the, to the finish. Now, most patients vary in some way, but there's probably quite a lot that are very similar. So we can look at the length of some of these processes that make it up. Are they actually delivering any value in some cases? And also, how could could some of these things happen in less time to reduce the time it takes a patient to go through the system? If we could reduce just five percent of them, we'd see we'd get more people in. Yeah, no, I fully agree. Yes, um, certainly our hospitals will have done a lot of that sort of analysis, and there's a big push on trying to ensure uh, that we get a proportion of patients um, ready for discharge earlier in the day. Because obviously, um, whilst we don't want any delays, if there are delays. We would rather those those mm -hmm. happening and to still enable us to, to discharge the patient. I mean, it is it is the traditional basic things like um, have they had the right clinical assessment? Have we ensured that drugs are ready to be um, prescribed and, and, and taken home? Um, have we ensured that that uh, home care settings are appropriate? Have we ensured that there's appropriate transport? But really basic things. Um, but as the health service comes under pressure, all of those basic things become more difficult to deliver. Um, so, so there is a lot of focus on that, uh, but all of the work that we're doing about trying to just take that pressure out of the system will all help some of those 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 elements work effectively. Whilst we also look at the transformation of pathways that, that again add some add some benefit to that. You certainly have plenty to go at. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Okay. Can I come back on that discharge planning? Um, I can give you two instances over the last couple of years. One was in a rehabilitation hospital 
if, if that's what you still call them nowadays, and one was in the acute hospital. Okay, the acute hospital, um, the doctor come round about half ten in the morning, said to the patient, you can go home, you know, they've done all the social services assessments and everything. Half seven of the night, the patient was still sat beside the bed because the medication and the discharge letter wasn't done. And when it was questioned, it, it just hadn't got through the system. But I don't think that's unusual. The other one, a uh, rehabilitation hospital, it worked like clockwork because two days before um, discharge, they were getting this information. I know it's a bit different because, you know, in rehabilitation, you can see where the, the patient's going. But, you know, it, it just worked like you know, the medication was there first thing in the morning, the discharge letter. Um, there was a bit of a, a blip with the ambulance, but never mind, that's another issue. But that, you know, from sort of half ten of the morning till half seven of an evening, for somebody to be sat in a bed in an acute hospital because the medication wasn't ready. And, and, and whilst whilst that's a reasonably extreme example, it's certainly not an uncommon position that, that, that we would face. Um, I would say that, that there is a significant amount of uh, joint system focus on this. So, so we, we now have daily calls uh, at an executive level and at an operational level, and there's an expectation that each of our providers are able to um, provide the numbers of people who are um, who are discharged or who are ready to, to discharge. Uh, we have uh, significant targets that they're expected to meet in terms of patients who are ready to be discharged at each, each part of the day, and then we measure that progress. Um, as, as I say, I think... Um, I think the pressures that our, our hospitals are facing at the moment, particularly around staffing, um, have slowed down some of those things that we would traditionally take for granted. You know, you go back probably 18 months ago. Well, no, just after COVID, so pandemic. But, you know, it, no, it was actually, it was last summer. So, you know, I just... Um, yeah, there's certainly not new not new challenges, um, but probably been exacerbated slightly over the last, last six months and have, le have been one of the factors, one of many factors that have led to some of the challenges that I think have been faced over the last, last couple of months, um, but certainly an area of, of real focus for us. And, and, and whilst, I, again, I would say there's a significant amount more that we could do, um, we can see a steady decline in the number of patients who are, who are um, medically fit for discharge within our hospital. So I think we are we are making slow step but steady progress in starting to unlock some of those opportunities. In the old days, you'd have discharge rounds, haven't you? And we and we still do and we still do. And actually that again, um, some funding coming out has come out in the last couple of weeks for providers to expand space for discharge lounges. Um, but it still it still relies on on the sort of the human intervention and just making sure those processes are as slick as they can, uh, and, and there's definitely more work to do that. Yeah, brief, please. Um, just to say that my experience as well was that dispensing drugs seems to be a major stumbling block to discharge process. That seems to um, uh, introduce delays. And I'm wondering whether that process can't be looked at and made more efficient. So that's, uh, And my second one would just be a little bit of a caveat around the language we use when we're talking about right to reside and patients who are stuck in hospital, not through any choice of their own, but because they're unable to get the social care support they need, or whatever. Um, there was one lady who uh, I saw in hospital who was very distressed because she said, I've become a bed blocker. And this was very upsetting to her. Um, and it wasn't her fault because she was waiting for a, a, a process to take place. So I'm wondering whether we need to be a little bit careful about some of the language we use to make sure that the patients aren't feeling blamed to this, whereas it's, where it's a system issue. Yes, I mean, obviously, the, a lot of the language and the definitions and, and, and yeah. things are, are, are set nationally, but, but certainly we wouldn't ever expect to be putting a patient in a position where they felt that they were. Uh, but that, that, that they, they were impacting upon a hospital. The hospital's job is to ensure that the patient is getting the appropriate care until such time as they're, they're no longer residing. So I'd agree with that sentiment. Thank you, Councillor Pope Small. I'm looking at your slide on out of area placements and mental health. Yes. Initially, we picked up on the bone, so that we've got 1,400 cases. 
think are the rate as good as the September. Um, what proportion is that of the total placement? So you've also got an ambition to get to zero by the summer of the year, I believe. We have got an ambition, yes, by the summer of 2023. Um, I'm, I'm not sure on the um, percentage, so we'll, I'll check that out. The, the, the days in there are, are bed days as opposed to overall patients, so the number of patients are, uh, are significantly smaller than that. Um, that said, it's still, it's still a material proportion of our, our overall patients and uh, is probably an area where I think we would have um, more concern and feel like there's more challenge to hitting our uh, objectives there than in some other areas. We've seen quite significant additional pressures on our mental health services. And by our, I mean the NHS in, in general. Uh, we, we regularly face um, situations where there aren't mental health beds available nationally, not just at a regional level. Um, and so whilst we will do everything that we possibly can to uh, ensure that it's a, if a mental health patient does need access to a bed, that that's done locally, um, there will there are often occasions where, where we've just got to take whatever bed is available and then work with them to repatriate them. Um, that said, one of the one of the um, big opportunities that we've got is we, we've just um, uh, just been able to commission some additional capacity within Birmingham. So hopefully, as of tomorrow, I had a message while I was sitting in the, in the meeting earlier, uh, we should start to be able to access an additional 20 beds. Um, so obviously, um, 20 beds over a 30-day month is, is 600 um, bed days a month. So if we are able to start to repatriate um, some of our out of area patients, there's an opportunity, potentially an opportunity there to make quite a big inroad in that in a short period of time. Um, that said, I think we, we would still hold our hands up and say, whilst we have an ambition to meet zero in quarter two, um, we would need to need to make significant improvements in things like our length of stay within our mental health beds to be able to reach that point I think, at the moment. Okay, thank you for that. Well, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, members, for questions. Uh, does the committee actually note the update on performance against the finance recovery plans? Be happy to note that. Okay, thank you. Do members wish for any further information to be included as part of future of BSAL ICS reporting on performance against finance and recovery plans? Really, other aspects we want to be included. We have people with what we've what's been presented. Assume that that's okay. Uh, there's a further update due on the, to be, the joint hospital, which will be back here on the 13th of March. I understand, Paul, you won't be able to attend personally. Will you be able to potentially send a representative to report? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you for that. The date of the next meeting is going to be Wednesday, the 15th of February at six o'clock at Solly Hall. And I, unless there's any other urgent business, Thank you everybody for your time today and your effort. We appreciate it. Thank you.